I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, special meeting for uh, the season's gas station matter. Uh, this has been, been before us uh, several times, December 6th. Um, we had a, me a meeting in January, I think, February 22nd. And uh, this is installment number four. Um, for those of you who might not uh, have been here before, I'd like to just outline some of the introduce ourselves and uh, sort of explain the rules of the road here. Um, my name is Lisi Gescheit and I'm the chair. And uh, to my left is Mike Marcello, who is our town solicitor. Next to him is George Alzebach, who's a voting member. Um, Edwin Shore, uh, Sh Shore who, Sober. Sober, who <laughs> is our alternate. And John Houle, who is our um, building official and zoning official. To my right is David Collins, and to his right is our wonderful realtor, um, Jen Hilton Kavanaugh. Uh, next, to her, next to her is Jay Jackson, full voting member. Uh, next to him is uh, Barbara Motijo, did I pronounce that right? Close enough. And Tara Ferreira uh, is our uh, note taker for our board. Uh, we are starting out today, um, I'd like to remind everybody that I know this is a contentious matter and there's a lot of people that feel very strongly about um, this project, but I would request that everybody um, be respectful of one another, um, you know, no clapping, no, uh, no, no noise, no yelling, um, because it only slows down this process. Um, I have given my word that everyone who wants to be heard will be heard. And I don't care if this goes on until next year. We're going to sit here and hear it all. But I ask you to please be respectful um, of the litigants, the people who are here, the board members. Um, and I appreciate that we're at close quarters tonight, uh, but we couldn't get the high school. Uh, it wasn't available for us to, to get. We tried. We tried the junior high school, we tried the library. I mean, we've tried a lot of things and this was the largest space that we could deal with. So I know it's not optimal for everyone, but we gotta put a, do with what we, what we got here. So with that, um, Mr. Stolzman, if you'd like to begin. I would, uh, thank you. Um, make sure the microphone is on, everyone can hear. Uh, a little house, as, uh, Mr. DeVidio mentioned in an email uh, either the end of last week or earlier this week as a matter of housekeeping, uh, we still uh, are at a bit of an oblique angle. I had to look that up, um, but uh, we're not either parallel or perpendicular uh, to the witnesses and the, um, the board. Uh, but I think uh, I moved the table back. That was okay a little bit. I would propose that our witness sit at the table and use the microphone and counsel stand at the podium. Um, this way they can just turn a little bit and we can face everybody, if that's okay with Ms. Benson. I mean, I think this is actually a little more conducive. Yes. Um, uh, I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable. Uh, 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 okay, good. And that's the way the room's set up and we're ready to go. Okay. With that being said, I just want to make sure the, the physical logistics work. Uh, tonight, um, I, I'll make a brief introduction and then uh, uh, we had finished with uh, Mr. Eric Simpson. Uh, as our environmental witness. So I have two remaining witnesses, Mr. John Shevlin, our traffic engineer, and then Mr. Jim Hool, uh, a real estate expert. And those would be the witnesses we would I proceed with. I appreciate the supplemental materials that you forwarded to us. Thank you, we, we did, yeah. And in those packets were all the materials we had referenced, but some had not been submitted. And there are, no, um, there are two uh, new slides in there. I don't have to show them, I can if the board has questions on them. Uh, we did a, uh, another photometric slide that shows the same light uh, patterns on the site, but this time with the landscaping. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's just uh, for your, someone had asked that, it would, um, to, to demonstrate that there's less light protrusion uh, with the uh, landscape. Of course, that makes sense. The yeah. Landscaping interferes with light. But it still demonstrates uh, our, our fact uh, witness um, uh, and our expert demonstrated, or testified that there were, uh, the light would uh, 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 be at zero foot candles once it's into the road. 
I just of course, wanna, you, you can still see it, but right. it's, it's not generating new light. I just wanted to remind uh, the members of the audience here that all of the paperwork that's been filed is in our um, office here at, at Town Hall, and you're free to come and inspect them, make copies of whatever you want, you know, take pictures of it with your phone. You know, we're, we're, we're here to try to educate the public, and, and so you, that you know what, what is in the record and what's been filed, okay? So, um, yeah. Great, great. Oh, oh no, that, that, that's fine, Madam Chair. Thank Excuse you. Um, Can I ask a question before it goes any further because yeah. you didn't mention what uh, we left some. Um, we left something open last week, and you had stopped me from asking one of your experts, oh, but I'm he's sure. not coming up today. That I am unhappy with the location of the tanks and moving the building, and you had interrupted us both and said we're going to look into it. But tonight you didn't say anything about it. You're bringing two new experts up. Oh, and uh, so I do have a. A long discussion about the location of the tanks and the way you moved the building in the last minute. M Mr. Simpson is here. I'm sorry. Y yes, Mr. Alzebach, I did forget about that. Not forget Thank about you. that. M Mr. Simpson is here, and he's and we're happy to discuss that. Uh, we did submit um, uh, a um, another slide that shows. Uh, with respect to the question of what happens if cars are queued up, a storm's coming, we get a bunch of cars queue up at the tank, line up at the tank, fuel truck comes, sees he can't get, the driver sees he or she can't get to the fuel tanks. So what we did do is confirm the geometrics of the site is that the, the tanker can come off, the fuel truck can come off the road, doesn't have to wait on the road, and there are several we have a few, in that slide, a few stops along the way. That doesn't address the location of the tanks, but I wanted to make sure we had the geometry. So what, so what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll start by asking Mr. Simpson to come back up and we can have that discussion if that's satisfactory to the, the board. That's fine. Okay. Um, Question, will you also have Mr. Simpson testify to the new report for the benefit of the public? I mean, we have it, council has it, but um, you know, it came as a huge mine file, so I'm not sure how the public could make comments tonight unless he summarizes. Yeah, why don't we have him do that? Okay, that's fine. The, Thank you. The, the supplemental report? Okay. And, 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 Madam Chair, just as a more further housekeeping. So, last hearing, there was uh, quite a few documents that were presented for just introductory purposes. Um, since then, those documents were recently, was March 8th, provided. At the last hearing, it was requested whether or not we'd have the opportunity to cross-examine the authors of each one of these. So for example, as the plan view, I, I apologize, the very nice young lady there, she typically testifies to that. Um, we asked whoever authored, for example, the renderings, whoever might be the author of the exhibits, you indicated that, of course, we'd have an opportunity to examine that. And so I want to make sure that that's still preserved. Well, yeah. I mean, you're free to subpoena them and get them here and in your put them on in your case. I mean, they, they filed a lot more material than what we required. And I appreciate the fact that they've gone the extra distance by producing, reacting to everybody's concerns. And this is an, has become an evolving process. Respectfully, Mr. Madam Chair, you in the, in the transcript confirmed and assured that the time when that information would be presented, that we would have the opportunity, you indicated that we'd have the opportunity to cross-examine the authors of those exhibits that were being introduced for discussion purposes, and tonight they were going to be, uh, the foundational uh, aspects of those documents would be, would be presented by the authors or whatever expert who can speak to it, and then we'd have an opportunity to cross-examine. That, that's fine. We have every expert here tonight except Mr. Pimentel, our planning expert. Perfect. And, um, uh, and uh, Cheryl, <laughs> <laughs> I, I still want to call her Bizak from her maiden name, but uh, Cheryl's um, um, here and from Dupreet Engineering, and if she didn't author them, Dupreet Engineering retained subcontractors to do them, and we can talk to whatever. Um, they want. Mr. Simpson's here and um, happy to also to answer any environmental questions uh, that we have. So um, uh, we'll, we'll respond as yeah, you, I mean, you, you see. You guys can figure it out, right? Yeah, yeah. So, we, well, if, if there's questions boys, for, you, there are questions for witnesses that are here or we'll bring them next time. That's fine. Right. Um, 
the, the final slide was uh, there, there was there was discussion generally about how does this site compare to other sites and, and uh, sites and communities that um, uh, Bristol Warren. We also just recently completed a site, we, uh, Colbia completed a site in Lexington, Mass, which is similar and ex almost identical in terms of the store, uh, the convenience store and the pumps, um, uh, disp uh, the fuel dispensers location-wise. So we just submitted a slide that shows the geometry of that site and this site. And, and uh, it, it's, it's notable that that's, this site's substantially larger than that site. We just put that there for your When for you're your referring to slides, are you talking about the stuff that we got? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that might be the last, the, the last slide. Okay. Well, with the, with, so that, that, that's the information that's been provided. And I might now just call Mr. Simpson so we can get into the discussion of the location of the fuel tanks and any cross-examination, further exam. And then he can summar. Would you like him to summarize first his supplemental report? Yeah, I think that would be helpful to the members of the public. Okay, sure. So Eric, if you can come on. You can sit in the, the stage right chair. Take your time. <laughs> I can't see. Can you hear? Okay? I can hear you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Can we swear the witness in, please. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide. I swear. Please state your full name as well your last name for the record. Eric Simpson, S I M P S O N, like the TV show. <laughs> Been using that a long time. <laughs> So I guess I can just start in, or let me. Yeah, Mr. Simpson, you, we submitted on your behalf um, a letter report dated March 5, 2024, that was in the packet. It's uh, three pages, mm -hmm. and it addressed um, the sound light study, and um, uh, it was it addressed this, your supplemental report on sound light study. Sure, um, I prepared that at the request of, of Colby S. Seasons. Um, They've hired me and my firm to do a variety of light and sound studies um, across a lot of their facilities that they've, they've constructed, uh, ones that were being proposed, ones that were also um, um, had been built as, as comparison studies. And in, in fact, last night we did a light study for a community on Cape Cod for a new store. Um, so this report doesn't include that project because that was last night. but. This report was a, a summary of several of the, the light and sound studies that I've done. Um, it, in terms of, I'll start with sound. I focused most of my attention on what most communities are concerned with, which is the drive-through speaker area um, in terms of customers ordering um, you know, coffee or, or whatnot at the drive-through and then picking them up at the window. Uh, what does the sound carry from that, that speaker system? And then also the gas station TV that this little display that runs um, on most dispensers now that you see. It, they, they, they didn't exist like 10 years ago, but um, they're everywhere now. There's a sort of a, they talk about the weather and they do some advertising. And what does the sound carry from that? Um, to that end, I've done sound studies on you know, varying weather conditions during the day, during the night. Um, in clear weather, in cold weather, in humid weather, Obviously, all of these things factor into sound, but I was trying to determine what is the distance, the maximum distance that I can detect it um, with a sound meter at 0 0.1 decibels, which is sort of a lower threshold of what you can, you can actually hear. Um, to cut to the chase, dispensers, the gas station TV dispensers, I've been unable to detect sound from those at a distance of more than 15 feet. Um, so typically, if you were to imagine a little 15-foot radius around each one of those dispensers, that's roughly the sound carry for a dispenser. In terms of the drive-through, all of the sound studies that I've had, the maximum distance I've found is 90 feet for the speaker system uh, for sound carry. Um, and that was the most distance I found was a location that Colbia has in Warwick, Rhode Island. Um, all of the other ones were a little bit less, but I use 90 as my default because that's the maximum that I've found. Um, that information is reflected in that report. Um, in terms of this particular facility, there are no residential receptors within those ranges. Um, obviously, the 15 feet is, is pretty self-explanatory. 90 feet from the drive-through doesn't actually leave the property. Um, so 
based on that, I would not expect sound to be heard from the drive through at, at residences, say, across Sousa Road. I have a question for you, and that mm -hmm. is if all those gas station dispensers are all playing at the same time, yeah. what's, what's the cumulative? That was the 15 feet was the max. Um, I did that individually, it's less. When you have multiple stations, and I did this on a, a different site, also as a Warwick Ave um, site, when you have, I, I queued up multiple, waited for multiple customers, and it was 15 feet was the maximum that I could detect it. I have a question. So I appreciate you did the study. Well, this has been done many times with a lot of others. Sure. Uh, something is missing out of the study for me is the actual traffic going to the pumps. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times you stood at these pumps and took a studies the traffic. When a, an F-250 diesel pulls in at 9 yep. o'clock to get fuel mm -hmm. and it's running yep. and stays running, do you have a volume for that? I when do. When a car pulls in with the stereo, just let me add this. Oh, sorry. Uh, when, a, when a car pulls in with the stereo blaring at 11 o'clock with four kids in it, mm -hmm. do we have a study how far that noise go to the neighbors? In terms of the first, in terms of traffic, one of the aspects of what I'm doing is, is also measuring traffic noise. And there was a distinct correlation between road speed in, in traffic noise as opposed to engines. The faster cars drive, the, the tire noise on the road generates more noise than the engines do on average. So a faster speed limit results in higher traffic noise, lower speed limit, lower noise. I believe it's 35 here. So. But in terms of your question about stereos, that is completely variable depending on a, a customer. So if someone drives by if someone's driving down Sousa Road blaring the radio, whether or not they're going to the gas station or not, they're still driving by with the radio blaring. And that's not something that I factored into. So when, we, uh, when, you, when I lived in Quincy, I lived mm -hmm. next to a highway. Sure. After three days, five days, seven days, that noise is something you live with every day. Mm -hmm. You actually ignore it. So I appreciate you keep mentioning that before too, yeah. the speed of the road. Mm -hmm. The neighbors and that speed of the road they eventually use to that voice. The kids sleep through that noise. The neighbors mm -hmm. sleep through that noise. So it's not really, uh, what I'm saying to you, you could see somebody driving Sousa Road, they're gone by two seconds, and that volume is gone, mm -hmm. right? It gets deeper and deeper and gone, we don't count it. Yeah. But when they pull in the gas and they fill in up their F-250, it takes mm -hmm. over $120. Yeah. At almost eight minutes, seven minutes, standing there, mm -hmm. idling, stereo up. I think that should be included somewhere in the traffic says you tell me how loud it is coming out of that property. It's not driving by, it's not road noise, it's standing there yeah. filling up $120, 130 $150. Mm -hmm. And that diesel is loud as hell, I know. <laughs> and the stereo is loud as hell, which yeah. is we have to tell them to shut her off because I can't hear mm -hmm. myself thinking. So that, it's missing out of that report and I'm, I just find it odd. Yeah. I no, I haven't. never knew anybody that kept their car running when they everybody were filling does. it up. Yeah. You're supposed oh, yeah. to. Yeah. Not everybody to. does. Excuse one me. One, I do. one at a time. <laughs> with, with all due respect, this is, uh, this is what we do for the last 30 years. They do all the time, especially out of self-service. They do all the time, even at full service, and we have to actually ask. No one pays attention to that. I, they're not supposed to, yep. but to your point, that doesn't mean that they don't. Right. right. And yes. When you say can't be heard, mm. does that mean understood or there's zero sound? That's, that's, zero point, that's less than 0 0.1 decibels. You can't hear it. Um, it's not, so a, it's not a comprehension. It's, it's, you can't hear it. OK. So it's not the fact that you can't understand it. It's so low that it can't be heard by the average person. Correct. Okay. And, and I did that, in, I guess, empirically by, by standing around uh, at the back of stores, waiting for people to drive through, uh, order a Dunkin' Donuts or, or whatnot at, at a different location, and, and listen. And, you know, I have the meter. I can see the reading, but can I hear it, too? And, you know, I, I, at, at that distance, I, beyond that distance, I cannot. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, the Warwick location. Do they also have a drive through um, there's one on Elmwood Ave that does, one on Warwick Ave does not, or it might actually might. Does it? It does. Sorry. Um, and is there much difference in sound between the ones that do and the ones that don't? The, I would say the drive-through generates the sound, so within that 90-foot radius, it is louder because there is a drive-through. Um, it's quieter without it, 
but it doesn't carry beyond that 90 feet. So at a distance of, say, 200 feet, say the nearest about or 150 feet, there's no difference. If that makes sense. Good question. Mm -hmm. Do these displays and the voice coming out of the drive through there is the volume control. So if this happens to go through and those things get put there and it's found to be bothersome and maybe shut down, turn down. They, they can. Um, the dispensers have three levels of, of volume that can play on that little display. The, the audio on the, on the speaker system and the drive through is, is you know, infinitely adjustable. You can turn it up or down. Um, so if, if this were to get approved, and it was found by the community to be unacceptable. That's something that, that obviously the town can regulate and the town can come in and say, you know, we don't like this, this needs to change. And, and that's something that Colbia would need to do. Okay, thank you. Um, the next part, since we talked about sound, I'm going to light. Um, Colbia has asked me to do light studies on several um, locations. Specifically, it tends to be something requested by the community. Um, in part of the package, there's a, a photometric plan that shows foot candle readings based on all of the exterior lighting. Um, those are, are displayed in, the, in those plans. Or, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Can you pull that up? Yeah. Um, then, yeah yes, thank you. Sorry. That's that's the one. My um my I'll be honest. My older eyes do not like these, and I have to zoom them into big plans at Staples so I can read them, because I'm, I'm I don't know. I think I need cheater glasses. But <laughs> that's the original photometric plan that we had previously submitted. Is Correct. That, is, is that the one adjusted for landscaping, or is that's? Th nope. The one adjusted for landscaping is. I'm just just to distinguish between mm -hmm. them. Yeah. So this is the new one. That's the correct. One. And could we just identify it for the record so it's uh Have we marked this as a these have been submitted before, but I think this is new tonight. This, the, uh, the this one is was submitted uh, uh, ten more than ten days ago. Yeah. This was the um, we took the same photometric or the same light plan, but uh, had it adjusted for the impact of landscaping. Okay, so this has um, been marked. And, and, and what's the legend on it, um, uh, Cheryl? The, what's in the uh, your legend? Uh, it's called the lighting proposal. Yeah. It's dated, uh, it looks like it's a uh, lighting proposal. I think it says 222. 222.23. And then 3-7-24. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah thank you. And, and submitted on March 8. Yeah, we did get it. I just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I'm record. just for the stenographer, we can sit, so we can later identify this plan. Thank you. <clears throat> so in, in either case, what, what these are, and I, these are kind of hard to look at if you're looking at it for the first time, but the lighting manufacturer for all of the canopy lights, the exterior lights, the building um, lights that display, um, produces a computerized software that predicts what the foot candle readings are um, from all the lights when they're on. And that's what all of these little tiny numbers are. Those are foot candle readings. And there have been several communities that have asked uh, Colbia to then, who then in turn asked me, to go out and basically traverse the site once it's built and fully ready to be opened, but before it's opened, and verify that this plan as, as presented is actually reflective of reality. Um, in, in every case that I've done it, these plans overestimate the foot candles um, that I actually find um, on the ground. And so I do this at night, and I've done it, again, similar to the sound studies. You know, it, it's a little bit different if the moon's shining or the moon's not shining, but I've done it in both cases. I did one last night in, um, in down the Cape, and we traverse and we pay particular attention to the property boundaries because the, the goal of this and the, the lights are chosen specifically so that light doesn't trespass significantly across the, off the property. And that's what this shows. Um, and what my report um, details, which Mr. Solzman mentioned, 
is a summary of that, which is when I go to truth check this, if you will, the results I get are, are always lower. There's only been one ex exception, and that was the case of a street light on a, on a road off the corner that was not factored into the plan produced by, by the manufacturer because they're not um, going with that. In the case of, uh, Rob mentioned uh, Lexington, Lexington actually asked us in permitting to change the lights to produce additional light trespass and spillage into the sidewalk because the DPW wanted additional lighting. And we actually modified some of the corner lights to uh, accomplish that. And I, in, in Lexington's case, they wanted me to prove that we had actually increased the light on the sidewalk, and that's what we had done. Um, but that's what my report details is in terms of truth checking these, which is the computerized software estimation of foot candles, I'm consistently finding that this is an overestimation of light and actual light is less. This plan shows no light trespass really at all across the street or into the street, and that's what I would expect. The revised plan factored in trees. Um, obviously, trees cut down on, on light trespass even further. So the original plan was fine, but this one is, is even more. Obviously, the trees are, deciduous trees have, have leaves in the, in the um, summertime and not in the winter. So it, the original plan is a little bit more accurate during the wintertime, and this is what it would be like during the spring, summer, and fall. One more question. Sure. Me and you were odd last time, and I think we're still around, me and you. Uh, I, uh, I understand that you could put a light pointing down, mm -hmm. and I understand all the footprint that it covers. Me and you still odd at the canopy mm -hmm. and the lighting of the canopy, and you guys said you're going to address it, and it's obviously you just went around and you still didn't address it. Oh, that, that is factored in here. Okay, I understand. The canopy is a light you could see off the property. You could tell me how much light cover flies off, but the person across the street, the people who's living around you because you're moving into a neighborhood, mm -hmm. everybody knows it's a gas station. I think I use the same word. Mm. Sp especially after all these meetings, we all know that we're building a gas station there. You have a monument sign the size of a first floor building, right? Mm -hmm. Do we really need a canopy sign that the person who lives across the street have to look at that canopy light all night until you close, mm -hmm. which is we discussed a time later. Yeah. But it, the fact is, I find it overkill that we have all these lights and somehow we insist 3D, internal lit, whatever, however you want to call them. Mm -hmm. I understand we're always going to see the light from the property. I still have a problem with these canopies, and you have done not addressed that tonight. And I still yeah. do not agree those which should be lit. Yeah. And in, in other locations, you don't have canopy lit. In other uh, rural com towns, Cape, yeah. Portsmouth, Little Com, I mean, um, God, whatever that, Newport, Middle you have Cape. a lot of gas stations with one of them you own with no canopy lights. Mm -hmm. Because yep. that's what needs to happen when you come into a small town. You change your way of doing things. And I disagree yeah. with the lights on the canopy. Yeah, Mr. Alsbeck, we're, we're, we're not skirting around that. I just hadn't gotten to that yet. So, um, but let me, let me at this point, uh, I remember that distinctly, that interaction at the last meeting. And, and I reminded myself of that when I read the transcript. And I remember when you raised it, and I said to you that, th that we had reduced the lighting plan to the minimum allowed by the Shell standards. And you said, I don't believe you. I, <laughs> and, and, and I said to myself, if I may, if I may, I said, I don't think he'd ever accuse me of lying. So I don't think I was lying. So he must mean I was mistaken. So let me go back and, and look at that. And we did. And there is a standard minimum, there's a standard package. And the lighting plan we've submitted has been reduced down to the standard uh, package. And, and, and I don't, we're, we're comfortable saying this. There are, we can seek a waiver and an exception from the standard package. You have the authority to regulate the approval. It's your town. You regulate. The, the, if, if it's approved, you can do it with restrictions and regulations. And we will either be able to comply or not comply. Reasonable restrictions on lighting, we'll have to figure out a way to accept. Um, the only reason I was saying you're mistaken, I own two mobiles, and we all know, so you're expert, that mobiles and shell are very strict about their approvals. The town of Tiverton will not let a canopy lit at the time I was building my station in Tiverton. And respectfully to the town, I didn't put them through this. I just didn't put lights on my mobile station. 
what's a three dogs car wash, which become, eventually became an Exxon. So my point to you, yes, you could go back. You're not lying. I was accusing you of lying. I know, I know. I was just saying you could go back and say, do you want some, some gas and tip it in? That's what they want. So you, your understanding of the process is, as usual, right. accurate. And we understand that process. We're, it's just a chicken and egg for us. We, we, we've, we've got, we're going to pursue, we're, we're trying to demonstrate we think this has the minimum impact on the town. We understand there's a robust lighting plan on the canopy, uh, and we're prepared to address that should there be an approval with restrictions. Okay. Thank you. Question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, having listened to you, it, it sounds as if what you're saying is that the light that we can expect from this project is typical of what you would see in any other project like this, any other gas station, restaurant, drive through restaurant. It, 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 there, is there anything here that's, that you have seen that could generate light that is significantly different from any other gas station or, or, or use of the same use? Yeah, let me, let me try that in a couple parts. Um, the first part is related to this light study and how it compares to other ones that, that Seasons has had me look at. Um, this is lower levels of light than most of the other ones, um, certainly lower than Lexington, certainly lower than the one we just recently completed in Yarmouth. Um, and that was, I, I'm pretty sure, I don't, I'm not involved in the, the picking of the lights. I'm more of the person who goes and verifies that what was presented actually reflected reality. Um, and, and it's, this is lower than, than those. Um, in terms of what you can expect for other developments, certainly um, Canopy, to, to your point, whether or not the exterior band is lit is something I think the town can regulate. Um, a gas station with a canopy, there's more light produced from a canopy than there is, say, from a bank. Um, but the store itself, it, it's about the same. So it's, it's not, it, this is a lower light package than, than I've seen on any of the other ones that, that have been put in front of me. Okay, so the only, the only feature of this project that's a little different from normal is the light lit canopy. I would say that canopy ban that that you that has been mentioned as a, as a concern. I, I have a question. They're different from what project? Gas station or drive-through? What coffee shop? This is, has a canopy with over, I don't know. I'm gonna say. Let me think. Three, four, over 20 light, maybe 24 light lights under the canopy, just under the canopy. What drive-through will have that much under the canopy? It's a different project. That's what I'm asking. We have yeah. to compare. You only compare to a gas station. To others. Uh, he's right. So, the, the, one of the right. no, you're right. One of the things that you could, one of the things that you have to consider, or you could consider, is that fact. This is a zone commercial zone. So you could put a bank here. You could put something. Mm -hmm. So how much light would a bank with a drive-through, uh, to drive through yeah. teller, um, produce? So no matter what goes here, there's going to be light. Mm -hmm. And I think you're trying to figure out. If this is the lowest light you can get from a gas station, how does it compare to uh, a bank or other type of retail store, like a, just a regular convenience store? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're getting at. And that's, right. that, those are all legitimate questions that this board can consider. But I think the answer is, and I don't want to put words in the expert's mouth, is that this is the lowest light package, shows a one-foot candle not spilling out into the street or any other surrounding area based upon the modifications that were made from the original plan. Correct. 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 Absolutely. But for a gas station, not for a bank or a drive through I, This is totally compared. I'm sorry. I mean, he's, he's comparing it to another business. But he can do that. This is, and I'm saying you can't compare it because this, compared to another gas station, maybe the light is lower, but not to another business going I'm in there. Comparing it to what is allowed here. I understand. And I'm looking at gas stations right now with, with drive through restaurants. Yeah. Okay, I'm set. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, so just so the uh, height of the trees, I noticed mm -hmm. there's this arrow here. I just can't tell yeah. what, what is that. So what, what, what uh, the landscaping, oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, the tree heights are in, the, in that table. Yeah. Um, they, they show different red maples and, and different, a sweet gum tree. 
Uh, those are, are heights that the model was based on, and obviously those are, are reasonably decent heights. Um, but again, I, I didn't look at this too much because the original plan shows zero foot candle spilling over. Right. And this is sort of what's going to be applicable after a couple of years with the trees in place. Okay. That's not right. during the winter. Right. And obviously, so. I think you testified before, at least there was testimony before, that these trees are not going to be full grown trees when they're planted, but uh, it'll correct. take a couple of years to be mature. We're, we're confirming. Right. We, we generally did the renderings and the projections at around 50% maturity. Correct. To try to, yeah, know, I asked that question last time. I, I think, so, and, and we'll confirm, but I think we use fifty. So the the addition of the trees doesn't affect, did not affect the spillage onto the roadway. It was still zero candles at uh, at without any landscaping, but obviously the trees provide a better, well, a, a more of a screen, but it doesn't obviously doesn't block more. Right. Correct. Still zero, zero, zero. Zero, zero, zero. zero, zero. I, I have a tendency to look at everything being environmental. I look at the worst case of everything. Yeah. Okay. So that's why I tended to focus on the original one more than, than this one. So the, the addition of the trees does not decrease the light that <coughs> spills out into the street. Correct. It's still it, zero. It's just yeah. more of an aesthetic. It's just more of an aesthetic okay. blocks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but that's basically the light and sound um, report that, that we had added. Yeah, sure, we can get that. We'll, we'll confirm that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's this, as uh, Mr. Simmons just concluded, that's the summary of his additional materials. Um, does it make sense to discuss the fuel tank location now? Since well, while he's here, yeah. While he's, and, then, and then there may be further cross of, of him. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So if you, Cheryl, can you go back to the, uh, the original site plan that we've been using for tonight? Yes, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. Um, no, that, well, we can well, use that one, yes. Yeah, too. let's use that one, that, that's fine. Actually, if, if you use the other one, show the line that you moved the building, right? Oh, okay. um, mm -hmm. No, not that one. Yes, that one, okay, that's fine. Whatever you want. That's, those, that's right, the red line is where the, the no, no, let's, yeah. let's use that one, because that, uh, that addresses uh, a couple of different issues. Is that fine? That's fine. Okay. Yep. So um, <clears throat> what this plan this what this plan does is we uh, we. Uh, Rob, uh, I'm sorry. Can we just identify it so we know what we're talking about? Right. This this is. Um, give me one second. I have it. And I've got it right here as well. Figure. Yeah, what's the name on the this, this actual plan is drive through from Sousa? Yeah. Oh, okay. Drive through right. from Sousa. Right. Well, if you'll see at the Sousa entrance uh, last time, and we, we could use this for the tank discussion as well. Uh, Mr. Alzebach raised a good question last time. He said we, we were, by moving the building a few feet north um, and creating the bypass lane, uh, were we um, creating the ability and increasing the desirability to come off of Sousa Road and bang the right or turn quickly right into the drive through. So uh, we asked um, uh, Depreet Engineering to, to um, first I had not considered, and I said this, we said we didn't even consider that issue when we were try trying to create an easier flow within the site. So our first question was under the prior design, uh, was it, um, uh, did we already have a turning opportunity to come off Sousa Road uh, with any, without any difficulty having to back up or make a, an unusually wide turn? And the, um, the result was that w it was originally anticipated that if a car wanted to come off Sousa Road under the original design and make that right, they d had designed it to accommodate that. Um, now, when you move it up to two lanes, there's no doubt that may, that may make it more attractive. So there's, and, and, and th it's these nuances that are actually a little enjoyable, right? So yeah. w it's not our intent to try to draw traffic off of Sousa Road into the drive through And the traffic on Sousa Road is relatively lower. Uh, we don't have any objection to putting a, a no right turn sign there, or trying to control that in some way. The disadvantage of moving the building back down is is it it doesn't give us the um, the um, 
bypass lane all the way around the building, which we think helps with safety, movement of, of delivery trucks, it gives us uh, more access to the rear. It, we, the, the negative of it is we have that turn there that might be wider and therefore more attractive. The, we think the benefits, it's, we respectfully think the benefits outweigh the negative. Um, but there is, there is a, a, a turning opportunity there. But it's, the site may or may not be dependent on that, um, depending on, on um, the geometry uh, that you ultimately consider and if you were to approve it. By, by move, I'm sorry, am I allowed to keep asking people? I'm just going to ask questions, right? I'm just going to for OK. By, by you moving the building to, you took away my argument originally was that you had the ability to move the tanks from where they are right now which is if you're concerned about safety, I'm more concerned about safety of the public than one truck delivering every once in a while, now we're giving them a lane. So you took away a lane to move that tank to where it's supposed to be originally, which is something you agreed to, and your original plan were tanks on that site. They were not there all along. We looked at them at plans. They were on the left of the building, if you're looking at the building. Oh, can you, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, th I thought our tanks were up at the north end of the. During the master plan, uh, oh, if you could use the microphone. This is uh, to swear in, or if you would swear in, it's uh, uh, Cheryl Guglielmo from Depreet Engineering. Do you want me to spell it? Okay. Me to please, please. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please state, spell your, state your name and spell your last name. For Cheryl Guglielmo, Cheryl with an S, H-E-R-Y-L. Last name Guglielmo, G-U-G-L-I-E-L-M-O. I believe it was prior to the master plan submission. That w there's been several submissions now where the tanks were located along the curve on the top portion of the site. Um, we did move those. I believe it was the time of master plan. Um, but they were there at one point, yes. My, my, um, my problem when all along with any operation, you always need um, someone to sit when you're doing the master plan on behalf of the town to not to be able to say, oh, I'm an expert on this. I could argue with you guys how you move things around. That didn't happen here. Your original plan, where the tanks were. So we go back into the safety. If, if I may, let, I looked for a pointer tonight. I couldn't buy one. I was too busy. OK. <laughs> so I, I can't believe I know how to work this. Yeah. OK, so the, the original. I right. know I've got it's working. If you can see the red dot, the original plan, the, the tanks were up here. Is, right. is that correct? Right. OK, and I just want to make sure we're talking about the And thing. more than one location that belongs to you guys, you owned, you had put the tanks to the side. And I have sat across your stations in Fall River and a couple other locations where you have the tanks located like this and I have videos of it to show the impossibility of people pulling in. I, the old respect is one thing to sit in front of the computer and print it and say this is how it works. Another way to put it on the ground and work it yourself all day. So when you pull the tank like this, and me and you had that argument last time, you pull the tank like that and you block, I can you block number, let's say we'll start from the top, number one, two, three, four pumps. So on the top is number one pump. You block number one and number two for them to deliver 15,000 gallons, right? That's gonna happen if a busy location like yours probably every other day, you're gonna have a truck there. Maybe every day even. I got them every day, I'm sure you got them every day too. So you blocking that road. I don't mind about it at four or five o'clock in the morning when there's no storm coming in, the weather is beautiful, 80 degree every happy, no problem. But we're gonna snowstorm here in Liverpool, New England. Those pumps get so crazy, even at a full service station, I can't control the traffic. Mm -hmm. So you pull a truck right there, and you pull corn and telling the people, you could still dive into number one, you could still dive into number two, but you cannot get out. The guy comes behind him, he doesn't know that. He pulls behind number one, who's on the pump, he pulls behind number two. You got drivers who pull into the driveway to get their coffee in the morning, and now we have people queued behind each other trying to get out with your truck delivering. That's one problem I have with it. Second problem, your truck wants to bring it to the, make a delivery. On a stormy day coming, three days before the storm, we're selling gas more than we know what to do with. You've got people lined up on the pumps, Either way, diving, I know you put it one way and they all look at come this way. No, the gas tank's now on the same side of the car, so everybody dives in differently, right? People waiting in line where your truck is trying to deliver, and you put your truck and your tank in the middle of your traffic on a smaller location, 
and it will be impossible and unsafe. You're concerned about safely for delivery for trucks that comes in once in a blue moon, but we're not considering the safety and the traffic and the congestion, which is if you go to your own location in Tiverton, in Fall River, and sit across the street from it, and I got a video I could play it for you, how impossible for your truck to pull in and make a delivery, never mind making the delivery. Yeah. So. You, you had the tanks originally up top, and I was happy with that because this is, this is what we do. I thought it made sense. It's off to the right, off to the left, I'm sorry, if you're looking at the building, away from the traffic. Your truck pulls in, has to pull into the exit, back up, park over there, and deliver. Your only impact does before you move the building is your drive through on the coffee, which is we all know, as he said last time, is not going to be that busy. You might have to close it for 15 minutes and not sell coffee. That's your only impact. I find it very unconscionable we could allow this to be changed where you're really the safety and the traffic. I know we're going to say this is part of the master plan, but, but it's still here for, to be approved for a gas station. And, and the safety of the people not being taken into consideration, the knee stack need to be brought out where they were. And that's how I feel about the tanks. And you're here to, I know it's part of the master plan, I wasn't there. You're here to ask us to approve for a gas station. I consider that's a problem. Uh, we're, we're not arguing with you. His finger up my yeah, we're, and, and we're not arguing with you. Just okay. to, to, no, no, I to we're no, listening. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll just, respond to that make, after Michael. I just want to make it clear. Yeah. We're here on a special use permit for a gas station and convenience store with pumps. Yeah. All these issues about location of gas tanks. Those those will if if this is approved. We only have a master plan approval before the planning board. Those will all be discussed at preliminary plan. All these issues, there'll be a technical review committee, and they will talk about all these other issues that are raised. But this is way beyond what the zoning board needs to be looking at. This is not part of our purview. We're here on a very strict standard as to what the standards are and whether that this applicant meets the standard. And the location of the tank is nothing that this, this board can determine at this point. They've got a master plan approval. Again, it's preliminary, I mean, excuse me, it's a general plan. Uh, and then when, if we get past this st next stage, they will then submit more detailed plans, which when the issues like the tanking, the queuing, and whatnot will be addressed. But, but this is not the purview of this board at this point. We don't disagree with that. We, we actually engaged in this discussion and the moving of the tanks for a little bit different reason. And, 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 and I'm not arguing against ourselves in terms of what's within your jurisdiction. But as a, as if, at the level of even Stolzman could understand it, the way the engineers explained it to me, it had the moving of the building was not related to, at all to the location of the tank. We didn't move the canopy at all. We moved the building because of our, as we got to think more and more about traffic circulation on the site after our f first hearing with you, that we wanted better safety circulation around the building and we had a, a potential bottleneck on the south side. So could we move the building, move it further away from the neighbors, 10 feet, but nine feet, but still move it away. And does that give us better circulation? Do we still retain the bypass lane on the north side if we move the building? Separate and apart from that, the discussion of moving the tank, and I, I, just so you know, it wasn't an attempt to, to, to make anything but the project safer. And now reasonable professionals that know how these things operate uh, can have different views on this. If we move the tank up, the, if the fuel storage tank is on this northern area, the concern was that a, it, while a truck was filling, it would park to the south of it and load from the passenger side. And this area would be blocked while the truck was there because it would be parked here in this area and, and the, the, the planners were concerned that that would create blockage for the exit. That, now, we could, we, at a technical review, at some point we could debate that or we could even continue to debate that in, in process. But that, was, that is how it was explained to me as, as why we moved the tank. Because I asked, why do we move the tank? We had it there for a long time. And the answer was, well, as we think more and more about the entry and the exit, and the, a good issue was raised, people need to be able to move their cars through this site. We thought we, by putting it here, here, and, and even at the risk of, of blocking, uh, uh, blocking uh, business service, since they're not there for a very long time, that was better and safer 
than the alternative. Now, uh, 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 listening to you, operators may disagree on that, and we have, I have to continue to learn about that. To, to respond to some of the comments, made, I am not changing the location because I'm part of the master plan or not. I'm responding to the safety as you're asking us to approve pumps. If this is safe, in my mind, if it's the way it's designed, I'm not changing master plan. I'm saying right now the way it is, I feel it's unsafe. And I can prove to you it's unsafe. It is, as you point out, that if you put the tank in that berm, that gray berm you have, that's your stamped cement or whatever it's called, right? That, oh, right? oh, yes, yes, right. yes. So your, the tank's location and the way they build, the field could be far left, and your truck could be tucked way far left when he delivers from the right. I, I could, I've walked that property, i walked other properties, I've built other plants. That berms could be smaller where people could still get out. That berm could be driven on, as you pointed out before, that the truck could pack on. Your truck will not block that berm. People could still out. Not changing the plant design or anything. It's still about safety for me. Thanks, Mike. It is about the fact that it's, if you try to consider the safety of the public on that location and you're asking me to prove for your gas station, I have very concern, and I could prove again, that that tanks, that location is unacceptable. All right, well, I'm going to ask the engineers to go back to the drawing board and, and make sure I understand that. Yeah. I, 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 at least I fully, you, I use my standard. If I understand it, I think I understand exactly what you're asking us to do, and you have safety. Oh, we, we'll need to continue to look at that. But we, the, at this point, we think that this is safer. But we all agree you, you, that it, it, it needs to be commercially reasonably safe, that we're not, we're not, we don't want to create an unsafe condition. And um, to go back to the drive proof from Sousa Road, as we discussed, me and you on a different, um, it will make me feel better is somehow not a sign because no one reads signs, and we all know that by now. Do not enter, you're going to watch it yourself, they're still going to come in the exit, and it just doesn't mean anything. Signs don't, no one follow them. I still need some kind of design that obstruct the people who come in. Sousa Road cannot become one of your access road. We have over 200 apartments coming up on Fish Road. That Sousa Road could become easily a traffic, the right, a thorough through, whatever it's called. I, I find it a way you could be designed, a way they cannot turn from Sousa Road into your drive through Your approval, your design should not give, should not be included in Sousa Road as you, one of your queue points. Uh, it's a small road, it's a two lane. If you start lining up cars up that road, it, never mind the public use, safety use, fire trucks, ambulance, whatever you name it. Uh, I find Sousa Road should not be part of one of your way to turn in, and you've got to make it difficult somehow for people to turn in. Uh, I don't know, um, a wall? I don't know what's the difficulty. Well, I, well, I, I, didn't do I understand that issue. We wanted to make sure that we understood it and demonstrated progress on that point. Okay. The traffic on Sousa Road will be addressed by the traffic engineer, correct? That's correct. Well, he put the picture there and talked about it, so yeah, I don't yeah. need to talk about it. Thank We're you. not objecting to the questions. Okay. Uh, Are there any other questions from the board for Mr. Simpson? Thank you. <laughs> um, so under your normal procedures, he, uh, we can make him available for cross-examination now, or questions from the public, whatever. We're, we're comfortable however you wish to proceed. But how the lawyers are, I'm sure. You, are you prepared to cross? I'm prepared to cross. I could use some water, too. Can you um, go back? Oh, yeah, are you going to stay there? Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. You can leave that one. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Karen Benson, on behalf of Preserve Tiverton. Mr. Simpson. Mm -hmm. Hi. I'm going to need your help to understand a few things about uh, what was presented tonight. Sure. Um, First, I want to understand, there are two lighting drawings. I want to start with those. Mm -hmm. uh, the original one, the original, can we see that exhibit, please? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, mm -hmm. so this is the one we had at the last meeting, and I want to understand, you didn't actually gather lighting data per se. This is information that you put in to a program to generate these results, is that correct? Correct, the lighting manufacturer puts in all of the specifications for the lights proposed for the facility, and the software that they use pre predicts this. So right. obviously the, the facility isn't built, so none of these values are, are exist in real life at this point. And for the data that you did collect, that's in the new report dated March 3rd, 2024, only one of the locations you actually gathered data at an actual seasons, correct? No, I've data, uh, gathered data at other ones. I produ produced uh, Lexington as the most recent example um, in that report. I'll rephrase my question. So the report that we have mm -hmm. only has data from one location. Because that was the most recent one, yes. So that's a yes? That's a yes. Okay. And the conclusions that you draw are also based on the one Lexington location? They're not really because I, I have several other ones. I felt when I was asked to do this report that Lexington was an incredibly light sensitive community and I thought that was the best example plus when I, that was the most recent one until the one I did last night. Um, well, that was in November, so that was the most recent one, and I thought recent data was, was better than older data. Okay. But I have other ones, and, and if Colby wanted me to, I could revise that and, and add that data in, but. But it's not before the board tonight? Correct. Okay, and the information that you used for this light study was provided by your client? This information is the map provided by Colby generated by the light manufacturer, yes. Right, and it says so right on the exhibit somewhere. Correct, like yeah, LSI, I believe, yeah. is the manufacturer. And then I'm, I'm correct in my understanding, uh, forgive me, I'm not mm -hmm. an LSP. You feed the info into a computer and then the report gets spit out. That map, yes. Right, doesn't take into consideration ambient lighting, uh, lighting that might be from street lights. Correct, it does uh, not. The canopy cover, how many trees are there, mm -hmm. it's, it's data. It's, it's raw data, exactly. It's raw data based on the lights that are proposed. Okay. And it's safe to say that there are various factors that can affect the light results. In fact, that's also on. It says the drawing itself says the number and length of the fixtures could vary and thus the photometrics could change. Correct. So a lot of this is sort of hypothetical. Right? And that's, that's what I was trying to get to with my report in that, and, and a lot of communities struggle with this, Lexington did in particular, is, is the computer software produces, this is what we say the light is going to look like, what the foot candles are, based on the lights that were selected for this facility. Mm -hmm. And in Lexington, Yarmouth, other communities have asked me to say, well, go prove it. Build the facility and then prove it. And that's when I go and I check well, you know, on this row here, it's, I'm supposed to have a 5.1 foot candle or a 0 0.1 or a 0. Can I prove that in the field? And every time I go to prove it in the field, my readings are lower than what's predicted. And that's what my report was trying to get across. Okay. And if you couldn't prove it in the field, that would be a circumstance where you could seek the, um, the waiver. Uh, from Shell, would that be fair to say? Um, that I don't know about the waiver from Shell, but if it didn't pass, I can tell you in Lexington and again last night in, in Yarmouth, if there were light readings that exceeded what was proposed and what the town accepted, the town didn't need to let them open. The town can make them change the light fixtures out, have me go back and re-measure re it, test it again. Um, the town has that authority to do that. Right, but if you impose conditions, if this board were to impose conditions and you couldn't attain them, mm -hmm. then what would happen? You'd have to change the lights out. So you'd have to ask for a waiver. It depends on what the source of the light is. If it's, if it's from, say, the band that, that's been the concern, that would be a waiver. If it's a light that's coming from a yard light or a, a, an illumination off the canopy, it might be the sort of thing where a different light fixture could be replaced. Um, there's a, several options that could happen. Okay, thank you. So, the report indicates that a light meter was used. That's your report, page two, paragraph two. Mm -hmm. 
it, it talks about multiples, which is why I'm confused. I guess this is where you're saying you're sort of putting your experience in. It's not actually yeah. here because we, no. we, you agree we only have one site where you actually took, and that's Lexington. Well, that's the one I put in the report, and, yes. But it talks about multiple light studies, but the board doesn't actually have, and we don't actually have multiple light studies here tonight. Fair to say? Fair to say, okay. yes. So paragraph two, that's uh, page two of the 3-5 report. That's not really what we have. Um, okay, let's stay with that table. That's table one of your materials, mm -hmm. where you did actually one light study in Lexington. Um, that summary doesn't include any information on what lights were present at the Lexington site. Correct, it does not. Okay, and it also doesn't contain any information to compare Lexington to this application mm. for Tiverton. Correct, it does not. Okay, at least that's not in your report. Oh, you, I think you already touched on this. Is it fair to say that the number and power of the lights in Lexington is also not taken into consideration here. In other I words, you not. don't say, the way you do on this plan, mm -hmm. on the plan you say there are going to be so many lights of different kinds. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry, could we go to the second light plan? The March 2024 one? But so we're trying to evaluate whether the Lexington model has any true value. It doesn't indicate how many lights were at Lexington or the strength of those lights mm -hmm. or whether they were focused up or down or sideways, et cetera. There's right. no information about that. No, that was not what I was asked to put together. Okay. No information about elevation of lighting. That's an issue here tonight, how tall the lights will be. Mm -hmm. Or the number or the power. Is that okay. A yes or a yes or no? Oh no, there's no indication of that. It wasn't. It was outside the scope of that report. What I was asked to do. Thank you. Okay. And <clears throat> with regard to the whole report, the supplemental report on March 5th, I just want to recall your testimony from the last session. Mm -hmm. You're an LSP. Correct. Right. A licensed site professional. Mm -hmm. And you testified at the last meeting that primarily what you do is site remediation. Primarily. You're an engineer. Correct. Uh, contaminated sites need to be restored. That's your ex area of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, yes, sir. That's a yes. Yes, that's a yes. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you. So you don't have any training per se. And I think you testified to this. I don't have the transcript in lighting or noise. That is not what my degree is in, no. I have staff on, I have personnel on staff who do. You learned how to take noise readings, for example, in the field. Correct. Yeah, okay. And you have the employees who are trained to do it, but you're not. Trained. I am not, no. Okay. And oh, you also don't have any training as a, an ecologist or a biologist, do you? I am not, no. Okay. And you can't say, for example, what impact sound or light might have on wildlife in the area, can you? That's not something that I've studied, no. So that's a no. That's a Nor any impact it might have on the neighbors or the residents of Tiverton, that is light and noise. I can speak to what I've detected and what my staff have measured on light and sound, and I can extrapolate that to what similar facilities look like, and I can conclude that this one is spaced far enough away from receptors that it would not be expected to do so. That, I can testify to that. Receptors, do you mean the residents, residents of Tiverton? Sorry, receptors is an environmental term that okay. we use. To, to, it, it encompasses both, um, I guess, both human receptors and, and, and ecological receptors. We use that. That's a very common DEM and DEP phraseology. I'm sorry. Okay. It's a habit. <laughs> Let's talk about the wildlife receptors for a minute. It's fair to say the property's been dormant for decades. Correct. Yeah. And as a result, it's overgrown and quite wild. It has. You've been on the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when you were evaluating the site for the impact, uh, for the applicant, did you observe any impacts to wildlife? I did not. You would agree, though, it's a mixture of shrubs, trees, grasslands? Yes. There's evidence of surface water bubbling to the surface? I did not see that when I was there. Were you there in the spring? I've been there in the spring, the fall, and the winter, but not the dead of summer. Um, so... It's fair to describe this parcel, given that it's been dormant, given its size, as potentially inviting habitat for wildlife. Fair to say? 
given its location and the former history and the, the issues with the soil, I, I'd be reticent to say that. Hmm. You don't think it could be habitat for wildlife such as birds or small mammals? Not very good habitat. It doesn't mean it isn't, but I, I can't speak to it really. Okay. Um, so you can't say with the required degree of certainty whether the property, if it was lit and full of noise and had a gas station on it, could impact either the residents or wildlife of Tiverton. I, I would argue that it would not affect the residents. I would say I can't speak to the wildlife because there hasn't been a wildlife study done there. Okay. But you really can't give us an opinion that it won't have a negative impact on the health, safety, or welfare of Tiverton residents. I disagree. I, I have data that shows the, the maximum sound carry from the, the facility, and I have distance to the nearest residences, and I have several light studies that show no light trespass, so I would disagree with what you just stated. You're going to be able to see the lights from the facility. You don't dispute that. No, I don't dispute that. Okay. And you also would agree that light pollution is a form of pollution in, in our modern society? It's defined that way, yes. Mm -hmm. Can you define it? Light pollution? Mm. Well, it's basically unwanted light that interferes with the natural environment. If I said it was an excessive or inappropriate use of outdoor artificial light, you'd agree with that? Yeah. OK. Um, and if I made the statement that light pollution can affect human health and wildlife behavior, you would agree with that? It can? It can, at certain levels. I don't believe that this proposal is that, especially in a commercially zoned area that is going to be, that parcel one way or the other is going to be redeveloped into something at some point. Because it's one of the few commercially available properties in the town. Whether or not it's, it's my client or somebody else. Well, thank you for that, but my questions are, is urbanization and light pollution a potentially negative impact on the citizens and wildlife of Tiverton? And I believe your answer is yes, potentially. If it's designed incorrectly and, and done incorrectly, potentially. Okay. I don't believe this is designed or, or implemented incorrectly. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about your last topic, if we could please, the USTs. Mm -hmm. um, your uh, report at the first page uh, under the manufacturer recommendations talks about it, talks about what the UST manufacturer recommends, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yes. And the reason for that is because DEM doesn't have any standards for USTs. That's not true. They have standards for USTs. They just have different standards in terms of placement than, than the manufacturer do. They have standards for UST removal. They do, and they have U standards for USD installation. What is USD? Underground storage tanks. Yeah. Okay. They have Sorry. standards for installation and inspection as well, and components. This is um, from the report that the applicant yeah. submitted, um, mm -hmm. first, pa first page. Well, I guess my questions are these. Um, if there's no UST regulations, what is the manufacturer's warranty on what will be installed here? 30 years. Okay. And then after 30 years, what happens to the UST? The warranty period is over. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, UST owners have to have private insurance in addition to state petroleum cleanup fund insurance. And it becomes a question after 30 years, is, is it commercially viable to keep using it? Does it make sense to replace it? Um, does it make sense to keep operating the facility? Those are questions that come up. Um, every component that you do, every, every building you build has a lifespan, um, and that's just the manufacturer warranty. But so. this insurance, it's a special form of bond because this kind of installation is particularly hazardous. Is that fair to say? It's, it's, a, not, it's it, not like building insurance. It's, it's different. Um, I'm surprised at, at the rates or not. My, my E&O insurance, my errors and omissions insurance is more money than the, the tank insurance. <laughs> that doesn't fill me with confidence. No, well, I just, <laughs> I, I think it's, it, I, yeah, I, just, I find it amusing. That's why I, I reflect on that. Um, yeah, th I, I, I'm not amused by that, all kidding mm -hmm. aside, that the closeout at the end of operations is, is through insurance as opposed, and the insurance is very 
cheap. I mean, what makes you think we would have, or the applicant would have the insurance if it failed in I'm, 30 years? I'm not following you. The, the state regulates this, so a tank has to be tested annually. Okay. It has to be tested triannually um, by third party inspectors. Um, the warranty ends at 30 years, but the state continues to regulate it. If there's anything wrong with the tank system, the tanks have to be removed. And if there's nothing wrong with the tank system, but there's no demand for petroleum, the tanks could stay in place. They can only stay in place for up to six months before the state requires removal. Ms. Benson, I think we're going to need to take a recess now. If that's, I think I actually have no questions uh, okay. for the moment. I can check my I notes. I don't mean to cut you off. No, not at all, Madam yeah. Chair. I've reached mm -hmm. the end of my notes. Thank okay. you. No. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a 10-minute uh, recess. Okay. Mr. DeVidio, are you ready to cross? No. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, I would have two, just two questions for redirect, but I can wait till after both Mr. DeVidio and Ms. Benson have done it. If that's Do you want to go now? I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, that's the way it works. You know? <laughs> no, I just want to make sure we were okay. I'm trying to be cooperative. With, uh, oh, very, that's, that's very appreciated. Um, and, um, appreciated. So... I'm going to try to see if my computer. Mm. Oh, I've got plenty of cord. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Oh, look at that. It actually does work. <coughs> Ignore. <laughs> Nor for a day. Okay. So, um, is this your document? Yes. You plan on introducing it? Possibly. We well, have a we have a ten day. Yeah. So, um, we'll do it for introduction purposes only. All right. In the same manner that Mr. Stoltzman did. Yeah. Can we just identify it so we'll. Throw well, it I'm not yet to that point. So I had a couple of questions. For you, Mr. Um, Simpson. So, at our last hearing, yeah, um, you indicated when I was asked about taking over Miss Miss Benson's question about light pollution. Mm -hmm. you, you don't. I don't, don't even need to look at this. You can look at me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to. My eyes are a little. Uh, yeah. Sure. Understood. So. Um, at the last hearing, we talked about, well, she brought up light pollution, but you and I had a colloquy on that. Mm -hmm. um, like, how far away down the road at night would you be able to see this? Mm -hmm. And you weren't able to give that response. Um, and I asked, well, wouldn't a nighttime rendering, a simulation, achieve that or demonstrate what you would see as a neighbor mm -hmm. at night? Mm -hmm. And you indicated that, yes, that was the correct way in which to demonstrate what someone might see. It's, a, it's one way to do it, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And equally so, um, Mr. Stoltzman, maybe on your behalf, indicated that we'll look into that to try to provide that information so that this question I'm asking mm -hmm. could be answered. Did okay. you or your staff or anybody else you know endeavor to generate a nighttime rendering or simulation as to what people in, in and around that area would see at night? I have not. Uh, okay. That's typically the, gener the, re uh, the renderings are typically done by HFA okay. in, in conjunction, but it has not been done yet. Okay, so, but you're the kind of the light guy, and so did you have any interaction with HFA to say, <coughs> look, we need to be able to generate something that will help me discuss mm -hmm. what, for example, the light pollution might be for people who live in around that area. I, I spoke with them. We yeah. just haven't gotten there. This meeting happened a little faster than I expected it to, honestly. Okay. So you're endeavoring to be able to show that? I, if that's acceptable to my client, yeah. Okay. And, and, and presumably that would help us understand, if you will, this light pollution that might be generated at night that Ms. Ms. Benson spoke mm -hmm. to. Is that yeah, accurate? I think so. Okay. I, I think... To clarify on my question when you asked how far to see, what was going through my head at the time is how far does the road go before there's a curve? How, what is that distance? I don't know what that distance is. I know that it, it sort of curves to the right. I don't know how far, how tight it curves, and I, I, I couldn't on the spot answer that question. 
Uh, understood. But I, I guess, getting back to it, the big concern is the health, way, welfare, and safety mm -hmm. of the residents. Not just people driving down Main Road, but Mr. Winter, Ms. Haywood, anybody who lives directly in and around that area, what are they going to see at night? Sure. Right? And so the only way in which to demonstrate what that might be is through a nighttime simulation. I think a nighttime rendering would help in conjunction with this, this light plan. Right. Well, the plan of metrics just mm -hmm. kind of says, okay, what's the light candles off the site? Yeah. Um, but if you're, the, I forget the gentleman's name, who lives directly across the street where there's going to be no vegetation, mm. that light might not be spilling over into his property in terms of light candles yep. or lumens, mm -hmm. but what is he going to see? He'll be out his see front it. window. Correct. Mr. Winter, Winters and Ms. Haywood or anybody in the community driving by. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping, because you can't answer that question, is there going to be light pollution affecting the general health and welfare of the citizens until you have that rendering in front of you? I, I guess I disagree with the term light pollution in terms of, of if you can see something, that doesn't necessarily equate to light pollution. Okay. Um, if you have light spillage or light trespass, as, as the term that's used in the industry, of, of actual foot candles or lumens, as you say, um, spilling over into someone else's property, that is, is actual light pollution. If you're, oh, sorry, I heard. If, if you're seeing something that isn't, you know, I can see the moon, I can see, you know, all the houses down the street, I can see, you know, the, the one person who has a, a crazy halogen light over their garage. That's, that's different. And, you know, I don't know, I would argue that the planometrics that have been proposed in, in show that do not show any light spillage off the property line attest to the fact that it's, it's protective of, of the area. Now, you will be able to see it until they shut the lights off when they close the store and then the lights turn off. All of them? All of them except for the, the interior, whatever safety lights that you, you normally would have in a commercial property. So, so the that, canopy turns off, the, the monument sign turns off. Um, so um, so it's going to be open from 5 in the morning to 12 at night. I'm not sure what the exact hours are because that's... Okay. I, I heard that bantered around. Mm -hmm. But certainly, certainly there will be periods when this uh, facility will be open and operating thus the lights will be on mm -hmm. whilst it is dark out. Correct, yeah. So if it's dark, like it is now, mm -hmm. and that facility's open, we don't know yet what, because you haven't had the opportunity mm -hmm. to see or uh, evaluate what that impact or what a neighbor might be seeing until mm -hmm. we get this simulation. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so with respect to the uh so let me ask a question are, are you familiar with renderings versus simulation the difference mm -hmm. okay could you maybe explain sorry, sorry. So you, just, you have to say yes or oh no. i'm sorry I, yes yeah go ahead uh, a rendering typically is, is a computer aided drawing showing what something would look like a simulation is is typically done more live stream with actual data to to plug in to actual actually simulate what's being produced Right, so my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. is that a, simul a visual simulation actually takes a picture of, uh, of what actually exists, mm -hmm. and it inserts as nearly as accurate as possible what is being proposed. Correct. Whereas a rendering is kind of like a drawing. Yes. Okay. So, let's see here. <coughs> so, and by the way, this right here, is um, the uh, pictures, this is what was submitted. Mm -hmm. This is submitted. By? By the applicant. Okay, so we just, just identify it, we need to identify Sure, it. yeah, this is, this is the package that was submitted uh, by HFA or the applicant, right? So. But we need to have it identified what this, what you're referring to. Uh, I'm referring have a, have to, I, I don't know exactly what the, what you've identified it as. So, uh, I, I think we have it. So, this was a supplemental, we'll, um, it's a HFA rendering 
with a do not enter sign. It was submitted uh, as a supplemental package, so we'll just call this uh, with the blue car. So just so the, for the record's clear. Yes. Yeah. So there's a number of renderings, if you will, and I apologize, um, that were submitted by the applicant. This one here, you see up there, okay, um, is on Main Road looking if you will, in a southeasterly direction. Is that accurate, Mr. Simpson? I was not involved in the generation of these, so I oh. can't, I'm not the right person to ask. Southeast is correct. So you were. Well, well, we're going to do, do one witness at a time, right? Yeah. Okay. So if he can't testify to this record, then you'll have to find another witness. But this, if he, this, this is not his creation. Understood. So are we going to get back to this submission? Because I know it was marked as an exhibit by the applicant that it was introduced last time for discussion purposes. And so I'm not sure when I will have an opportunity to ask questions from whomever is responsible for presenting this to the board. I'm sure that the traffic guy will be able to. If, if, if I may. Mr. Simpson is here for light mm -hmm. and noise. Ms. Guillermo will be available at every hearing and at whenever the board wishes for her to be discuss this. And our traffic expert will be talking about this point on the road as well, and it will make him available. Um, so whatever the board would like on, in terms of availability, we'll make that Sure. Available. I'm sure that someone will be here to talk about it to, to speak about this rendering yeah I mean that's what you're saying that someone's going to be there to talk about that's, the rendering. that's correct and, if, if, and Mr. Simpson can talk to it now if it's a discussion of light impact or noise right impact. I understand yeah. okay Mr. But Sussman it, there's no one here tonight to talk about yeah, this Ms. Ms. Guillermo okay. is here okay. okay. we have one witness on the stand at a time one witness at a time okay. so will there be an opportunity madam chair for me to ask Ms. Guillermo regarding these renderings at some point t tonight? Well, it's, it, it's up to the plaintiff to figure out how, what, how he wants to put his case in, but she's going to be here all the time for every hearing. Right. So if it's not tonight, maybe the next night. Okay. I, I was just a little confused in that because last time it was introduc introduced for discussion purposes and that there would be an opportunity. And it was, it, it, this entire 54-page document was introduced as an exhibit, 54 pages. I'm positive of it, and, and the last page is the is that we're rendering with the, the the plantings around it. So, it's been marked as an exhibit, 54 pages. We've had one expert testify to this exhibit, vis-a-vis -vis sound and light. So there'll be I just want to make sure for the record there'll be an opportunity to examine the authors of this exhibit. I don't know what it's been identified as. If if I may to to, to help. Mr. Simpson didn't refer to the renderings with his testimony. However, we're happy to immediately after Mr. Simpson go back to Ms. Guillermo if you'd like to do that with respect to the renderings. It's, it's, up, it's up to it, yeah, it, you. Yeah, we're willing to cooperate. I understand. With, I get the message. <laughs> Thank okay. you. That's all I have for this witness, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Can I ask Thank a question? You. Yes, of course. You spoke a few minutes ago of this experiment that could be run where you would simulate the light levels and at night and look at mm -hmm. a distance to determine the impact on uh, the on people in the area <coughs> and I'm thinking how would you determine whether there would be a negative or bad impact while you're doing that yeah is there a standard or something there is not it this gets very quickly into a gray area of perception. What, what my perception of no impact is might be different than, than someone else's perception. And there isn't a, it, it gets out of the science. It's not a, I don't have a, a line in the sand where I can say above this level, it's a problem, below this level, it's not a problem. This, this becomes subjective, does. So the experiment really wouldn't it, be of much value, would it? It, it would give a view of what it looks like at night, but whether or not people find it acceptable or unacceptable is, is really subjective. All right, I have a question. All right, thank you. Up. 
I have one question. Mm -hmm. So we, we go back to the sticky point for the canopy, me and you, about the lights. So we, we as we look at pictures of this, and you did the study for the light and the impact and how you got all the data, I find it, it necessary um, when you're trying to put a canopy and put a lighter canopy and get all the effect of the neighbors, you will look to see where and how far you could see the canopy pool driving toward the station, line of sight. So I had trees, I had to cut and everything and everybody to see my sign coming down Stafford Road, right? I look at your canopy and you're trying to put lights on it, 3D lights or internal light, whatever you want to call it. And if you're coming down Main Road, you're not going to see it until you get to the station. And if you're coming up Main Road, you're not going to see it until you get around Mrs. Herman's house a little past that. Yeah. So what the purpose, I'm having, as you study your light, what would be the purpose to light up the canopy out of the fact that it affects directly just the neighbors? No one going to see it coming down Main Road until they're on it, which is your monument sign way visible before that. No one's going to see it. I feel like you should be, as a light expert, at least make an effort, and I'm not attacking you personally. Please don't take it wrong. You should be able to go down and say, hey, before we build this canopy and put these three lights and let the neighbor next door cannot sleep with his kids until 12 o'clock at night, um, does it really serve a purpose? Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, driving up Main Road, I've driven that road a million towns, it doesn't. You cannot really see it until you get around the curve where, I'm sorry to keep naming you by name, it's the only house I can think of, Mrs. Herman's house, the big house on the right, sure, sure. and or you go down by what used to be Little Bear Lounge around the corner where the, the car deal is, and then you see the canopy. Well, at that point, I know if I see a monument sign. Do I really need a 3D light for that gentleman not to sleep at night? It, and I think that's a, a question really for for my client. And I, you know. The lights press. Sorry. Yeah. Well, if I may, we'll, we're going to continue to discuss that because the the I would remind everybody and as Mr. Simpson did earlier when he was starting to talk about comparisons, one of the things we, we've been talking about is how to compare the convenience store with uh, fuel dispensaries to another permitted use, because that's really the issue. So compared to like a CVS, uh, for example, a, farm, you know, a chain pharmacy, which is a permitted use, so, so, or a grocery store or a larger market. So, um, it, it, to, the current condition versus this condition isn't really apples to, to oranges. So, so, um, and uh, just two quick questions for uh, uh, Mr. Simpson. I just want to make sure that we're clear on um, on this. The photometric plan. You don't have to put it back up, but the photometric plan contemplates all of the lighting on the site. Right. The uh, so yes, so what, what's included in that? Signs? Signs. Camping, parking lighting? Parking. Um, uh, uh, any uh, safety lighting and store lighting? It, it's everything proposed for the development, right. yes. And so it's really not ambiguous. And those plans have been submitted. The lighting plans have been submitted. So there's really not ambiguous or speculative as to what the light impact would be in terms of the lumens, not what you can see, but in terms of the light <laughs> spillage, mm. where, where it's not, it, w w do you think it's speculative as, as to what those lumens would be? I, I do not, and the reason I put what my studies in other locations have shown was to back that up, in that what I've seen in real life shows less lumens and less spillover and less light spillover than what that proposed rendering is. Thank you. Now, I'm going to stop there. So, I have um, one more question. Before oh, you I'm sorry. Off. No, I, you, I'm sorry. you can ask all the questions you want. You guys are in charge. Before you take them off, I, you had mentioned that they shut the light at night. Mm -hmm. And from my experience is the LED lights, then they're not really, they're frowned on to be shut off at night. Like the lights on the monument, the price sign, the price over the pumps, the prices with the LED lights. Those, those lights goes off at night too. Just a clarification on those. They can I know other gas station leave them on, like the one in Fall River, you leave them on all night. Yeah. Your own station in Fall River, and you yeah. leave them on all night. Let, let's stipulate our lights will be turned off on all lights. Yes. Yes. Other I than safety. I just want to clarify. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marcel. I apologize for stepping over, Mr. Hausman. No, no, I didn't Yeah. We, we testified at the last hearing that our lights would go out, and we continue with that. And we'll, we, we don't want any lack of clarity. The hours we're proposing are 5 to midnight. 
and and at, and when we're not operating, other than safety, um, lighting, site safety, lighting, the lights will go out. Thank you. That concludes um, our test our um, testimony of Mr. Um, Simpson. He's been cross-examined, and your rules provide for questions of Mr. Simpson from the public, and we're prepared to and do I, that. I think. Uh, Ms. Benson has some more questions, too. More questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Very brief questions, Mr. Simpson. Uh, um, does your report um, match up with the exhibit submitted by the applicants entitled Summary of Signage Relief Requested? Your um, um, lighting report, lighting conclusions. I believe it does. Okay. So for the record, that exhibit, summary of signage relief requested, was in the most recent package of March 8th. It has a total of seven signs not exempt from the sign count. So can we agree that any data that's submitted on lighting will use this as the basis? Yeah, we've been removing lighting, so, so the current we have less light than that, yes. So we agree. Okay. And then I went back because it was such a long night, the last session, and looked at your direct testimony. And it begins, excuse me, your cross-examination. And it begins um, cross-examination, I think, of Mr. DeVidio around page 190 of the transcript. And in there, inter alia, we were promised a rendering of what the neighbors would be looking at. If, or the residents of Tiverton, if they're driving, what would they see? Not just the lighting on the site. It was, we were talking about headlights and the canopy and, and the monument light and the whole thing. And we were told that, as you've already done, that we could have renderings that would show that. And I think it would be helpful. Uh, again, it's, uh, but we could certainly, we would welcome that. Um, uh, the ability to get a nighttime rendering. Oh, no, that's Mr. Marcello. Um, I believe if we were to check uh, what the applicant m represented at the last hearing, uh, beginning at uh, 190 of the transcript of 222.24, you will see that we were promised additional information on lighting. I assume that's in the works. We're I'll, I'll check the transcript, Madam Chair. We've been producing what we are capable of producing. Bear in mind, these renderings are not required I, for I, your I, review I or approval. That. I'm just stating that yeah. to, to state as has been pointed out by the solicitor as well. We are, we are investigating to, to some type of apples to apples nighttime comparison that would be relevant uh, to this, and, and we're continuing to do so. I do object to the notion that we promised, we are looking at that. We, we're continuing to provide information. We're trying to keep this process moving along as well. Um, so we'll continue to look at what type of nighttime evidence uh, we can present that's relevant uh, to options to options. And, and, the, and the objector can certainly have the ability to produce their own rendering if they want. That's, 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 that's up to them. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure, and I'm sure they will. Okay. Uh, Mr. DeVidio, do you have anything else? Just, just briefly, uh, that uh, if, if the, the, and I respectfully, I think it should be visual simulations versus renderings. Renderings, I can do a rendering. Yeah. A visual simulation provides that ability. So if you're standing at Mr., I forget his name, lives directly across the street. Okay. He's, what's that? Moni, that's right. He's, he's, his, his property is at a lower elevation. Is that correct? I believe it is, yeah, yeah by a couple of feet. So a visual simulation says, looks at, like, if I'm standing on his property and I'm looking there, what am I going, and then you insert this season's station. Because as I can see it, he's going to be looking up underneath the canopy. So he's not seeing the ribbon around the outside. He's going to be seeing, oh, we don't know yet, do we? Until we have these renderings. Is that correct? Or simulations? Is that accurate? That sounds accurate. Okay. I would defer to the client as to the production of that. Uh, understood. And I, and I do get it from Mr. Marcello that um, 
the citizens of Tiverton could pony up the money, Ms. Haywood and the members of Preserve could come up with the, that money to generate these very expensive simulations or renderings. Um, what, what we hoped, based on the testimony that uh, my uh, co-counsel, Ms. Benson, recited, that there was a general agreement that, that this information would be produced. It's not required under our application. I, I understand that, but I'm just hoping, for the, abstaining for the record, to hold the applicant to his statement in the last testimony and tonight. They're going to be looking into this information. I think it would be helpful for the citizens and the members of the board to understand what Mr. Mone, Ms. Haywood, and Mr. Winter <coughs> are actually going to be seeing at night. Forget about the photometrics, what spills over. What are they going to be looking at out there at the night time? Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you just, need to respond to that? I do want to just make it clear. We disagree with the testimony. From the, well, I didn't promise to do anything but to try to find the best comparisons. We're looking into that. We're not going to be providing simulations. I, I don't know that I fully understand the distinction. But w w what's typically done, the normal standard thing, is to provide either elevations of a building, which are colored drawings, or some type of computer-generated rendering. We do understand there's going to be some more direct light impact to the neighbors immediately across the street. And our goal will be to try to find some way to, 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 to give you some indication of what a nighttime visual will look at. I don't know exactly what form that will take yet. We've been talking about with the rendering company uh, potential ways to visualize that. And of course, they're used to seeing that, well, how, how far away do you want it? What are the roads? So we're still talking past one another. We'll continue to work on that. And, and then again, I'll just finish with this. I'm, I'm happy to look at Mr. DeVideo's renderings that he can do himself. But the point of the matter is, is we'll, we'll try to provide you with, with what best information uh, we can do. And again, I mean, I suppose we'll con we should do them in comparison to other alternative uses that would be permitted there. Thank you. The rate we're going, you'll have plenty of time to do this. We understand. <laughs> um, does any member of the public wish to ask uh, the witness any questions? Why don't you come up and identify yourself, please? And this is just to ask questions, not to state opinions about what's going on. Based on late and sound. Well, my name is uh, Babak Kostrapur, spelled B A B A K K H O S R O P U R. Simpson is easier, I know. You're not testifying. You're, you're going to ask questions. Or we don't, we're not going to swear you in because you're just asking questions, right? Yes, I'm just asking questions. Uh, I live at 15 Leeshore Lane in Tiverton. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really have a couple of questions that have to do with um, the underground storage tanks and toxicity, which you testified to before. So you had drawings up of uh, before there was uh, what you called a, a condo farm across the street. So if you come down Sousa, if Sousa continues, it, it be, just changes name to Schooner and goes to a restaurant. And then where the old storage tanks were is now uh, where I live. That's what my address is. So that land we have, which is uh, the community is about, uh, you know, um, I don't know, 65 acres or so in that area, has 216 homes. My home is there. I've been there for 14 years. And the land starts at about 570 feet from the site, uh, as, as measured by me. Um, so my, my concern had to do with the underground storage tanks and the surface, uh, you know, gasoline and oil, et cetera, dripping. And, and I did hear, you know, how the tanks are built and designed and, and, uh, and all that, so I do understand that. <clears throat> On our property, besides having 350 humans, we have uh, a couple of uh, retention ponds that are uh, very carefully monitored by coastal resource management. All the problems uh, of that are our problems financially. If things go wrong, is this water uh, surface water? And we have at least two major underground springs coming uh, through our land. Um, we maintain all that. We have to. It's our land. We can't tell what's happening from above. Now, 
The underground storage tank, I, I, I understand how they're designed and how they're built. I, I, personally, we're talking about insurance. I, I've been an insurance adjuster for 37 years. And underground storage tank leaks are things that I have dealt with. There are possibilities of earth movement and things that are not deterioration due to corrosion, et cetera. So that's, that's one thing I was going to ask you. And the, sur uh, the surface dripping, you know, just oil dripping from people's cars or people spilling gasoline and then rain, moving that off. Can you comment to, to, to those to try to make myself and maybe 350 other people feel a little easier? Certainly, yes. Um, I'll start with, uh, probably the easier one to start with is the surface drippings. Um, that is, you know, anytime you drive a vehicle over, over anything, uh, vehicles drip oil or, or, or whatnot. You see that, especially older vehicles. Um, all of the new developments, and it, it, this is independent of a gas station. This is applicable to, to any commercial development. Stormwater now has to be captured, managed, and treated on, on site and managed so it doesn't basically just sheet flow off in the rain and, and say, impacts down, down Schooner, Schooner Drive. Um, so what this facility is designed to do, as well as all the other ones, is capture all the groundwater. Um, all groundwater, I mean stormwater, all stormwater systems are, are then routed <coughs> through basically a, a separator unit to capture any, any of those sorts of things. They're periodically cleaned out, and, and that's the easiest way to manage to capture sort of residual material from the surface. Is there is a uh, separator unit at the street level? It, or? It's underground. Okay. Um, so the, does it, if you envision a catch basin, uh, all the, the storm water flows into the catch basin. That is a, they, they have various trade names, but those are designed to basically entrap both sediment and, and any particulates or, or residual contamination or anything like that. Those get periodically cleaned out, and they're designed basically to prevent any, any stormwater issues from spreading around. And so on the other one, understanding that uh, our land is downhill mm -hmm. from, from the site, uh, it just starts right across the street and it, and it starts moving down. Um, in your experience, what would a, a devastating, let's say there was earth movement and you had a break anywhere in a joint or in the body, what, what sort of scenario have you experienced? Keeping in mind that there's not nobody there. There's Correct. 216 homes there. Yes. Um, the good thing that I can, I guess, if this helps to allay anyone's fears, and it, it may not, um, the new, what I call the new generation, or, or what I would call the third generation of underground storage tanks, we do not experience those catastrophic leaks. You've probably, in insurance, have dealt with catastrophic leaks from, um, typically gas stations had the first generation of tanks were steel, they put them in the ground, steel interacting with groundwater. Corrosion. Corrosion, bad. Mm -hmm. um, steel tanks had a history of catastrophic failure. Those, those legacy sites remain things that we clean up. Um, the second generation of tanks tended to be single wall fiberglass with single wall fiberglass lines. Um, typically, the single wall fiberglass tanks didn't usually have catastrophic failures, but the single wall lines tended to. So second generation sites tend to have line and dispenser contamination. Third generation sites, double wall tanks, which have been going in now for you know at least 10, 15 years on, on average. Rhode Island, I can't remember how long ago they, they required it. It's been a while. Um, we don't see that with double wall tanks and double wall lines because they're designed to have interstitial checks. Um, I have been involved with one location in Massachusetts years ago where an inner wall of a double wall tank failed. And when that happened, all of the sensors and alarms at the facility went off. Okay. They were able to pump the fuel out of the tank, uh, pull the tank out of the ground, replace it. There was no environmental impact. Um, it is significantly better than it was. But a lot of, a lot of the work that I do, not really generally for, for seasons, but for other clients, tend to be first generation, second generation tank systems that have failed in the 90s or prior, and we're still sort of dealing with residual contamination. Um, okay, thank you. I, 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 have I hope that else. helps. It does, thanks. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any questions? Hi. 
I'm Gail Lawrence. I live on Long Pasture Way in Tiverton. And so um, I was trying to review your testimony from the last meeting. And one of the things, well, many of the things have been addressed by others already, but um, I appreciate your thoroughness and your care and your patience with all of our questions. Um, I'm thinking about the soil that you reported was contaminated already mm -hmm. and that it is below DEM's standard of contamination. And I don't, I'm not that familiar with what the break point is. You know, at what point does DEM say, this is actually a brownfield and it has to be remediated? And maybe you could enlighten us as to that concept of a brownfield mm -hmm. and whether or not we might be referring to a brownfield in this case. Sure. Um, there's a couple different things at play. What the state does, and, and all states do this, um, the states establish levels of, of various compounds, be it petroleum, um, metals, solvents, whatever, that they feel are acceptable to remain in the ground without the state involvement. And those are, are generally called reporting conditions or, or you know, residential thresholds or, or that sort of thing. Rhode Island has established one of 500 parts per million in soil of petroleum. And, and those numbers change for different compounds. Some compounds are much lower because they have, they have higher toxicity and are more dangerous. Um, when I went to investigate the site, when, when Colby asked me to do that, I, you know, it's a, it's a large property. We didn't really know where things were going to be. And I did four borings and I took soil samples. And we had results at 190 parts per million. And I compare that to the state standard, which is 500. And that basically means in those four samples that no further work needs to be done in terms of reporting that to the state and in, in having that go into the state program, the state system, to require cleanup. Going forward, if this project were to, to go forward, Additional work needs to be done in terms of, of drilling and sampling and, and that sort of thing um, for a variety of reasons, structural and, and testing. And <coughs> if by some chance we find an area where the number is at, at 500 or 5,001, because it's a, it's a less than, you know, not a less than or equal to kind of thing. Um, if I get to 500 or anything above, that's reportable to the state. Um, the, the site owner has 60 days to notify the state of that discovery. And that goes into the state program. The state assigns a case manager. Um, we would then have to have a meeting with the state, explain what the designs of the project are. They'd explain what their goals are in terms of cleaning it up. And both of those things come together and, and remediation happens. Um, separate from that, in terms of testing soil, all of the states regulate um, even low levels of, of impacted soil, even below the 500 threshold. So in order to remove soil, additional testing has to be done. And I believe Ms. Benson had asked me last time about other testing that needs to be done, and that's in the record. There's additional chemical analysis that need to be done, not just petroleum. So a, a variety of things get looked at if a project like this goes forward. Um, if it doesn't go forward, then, then it doesn't get looked at any further because what we have right now doesn't require state involvement. Mm -hmm. But if you go over that number, then it turns into a site that the state manages and the state oversees the, the remediation of and the cleanup of. In your estimation, would it benefit the town to explore something like that for properties that were impacted by the industrial pollutants mm -hmm. that were there previously, whether or not a gas station goes there? I think it's, it's, that's a tough one because if you look around any community, there's probably a slew, hundreds of properties that, you know, every dry cleaner out there is, is, is a risk. Mm -hmm. Every former industrial property is a risk. And, and it's, testing's expensive. It, several thousands of dollars to drill wells and take samples. The labs tra charge a lot of money. It's probably not practical for a community to do it. Um, the regulations are written that the, the onus falls under the property owner. Okay. So if you buy the property, you, you it's yours. It's yours. <laughs> a lot of times when people are looking to buy properties, they, they get permission to test beforehand so they know what they're buying going in. Right. Per and sometimes test. sellers get surprised at what gets found. But. So similarly, I'm curious, and I think you mentioned that you have some experience in hydrology mm -hmm. as well as a geologist, and I'm curious about 
the treatment of groundwater and what the expected contamination levels of groundwater mm -hmm. might be in your view. And we all know that water does not stay wherever it is. It travels and it moves land and earth and changes mm -hmm. things. So I guess I'd like you to speak to whether or not what concerns uh, are being brought up by the fact that groundwater is, has maybe been contaminated. And I don't know whether you have samples that the state has now, you know, would give you, again, a, a, this is a threshold and so on. So could you speak sure. to sort of the concerns about groundwater that anyone who draws their w water from a well mm -hmm. might like to know about? Yeah. Um, the state, similarly to soil, has a, a regulated threshold for groundwater. It allows a certain concentration of, of various compounds to be in groundwater as acceptable. They have established limits for drinking water, obviously are different than, than water under non-drinking water areas. Um, the state actually maps all of Rhode Island um, as to, to what groundwater category things are. I have not put wells in here, so I have not tested the groundwater yet. Okay. What I can speak to is typically groundwater contamination kind of goes hand in hand with soil contamination. So if you en envision a catastrophic release from the old tank farm from the 1970s, if that were to have happened, the soil gets pretty saturated with, with that contamination. It sinks into the groundwater table. And then groundwater, as you know, moves. Um, the soil contamination we have in the four borings that I found doesn't suggest that it's high enough to result in a groundwater plume above standards or groundwater contamination above standards. I don't have the data. It's something, if this project goes forward, wells do get installed as part of our routine process and it gets tested. And you know, one of the reasons is a lot of the construction of deep structures goes into the water table and we have to test it so that we know how to manage it. Okay. Um, and so it does get tested. And, and again, if it's above a threshold, it has to be reported to the state. Okay. And then it, there's a managerial piece to that. Well, I mean, if you are treating the groundwater so that it is not contaminated mm -hmm. any longer, that's part of a structural piece that goes into the facility or the installation? It is. It that is. True? Yeah. If the, so there's two things that happen. If, if groundwater is found above the state standard, um, additional wells get installed. The state dictates that the, the limits or the delineation of it gets figured out. Has it gone across the street? Has it gone down the, down the hill? Mm -hmm. um, that's all required. And then depending on the concentration and if there's a, a receptor, I, I use that term again. Yeah. Um, if there's like a well, we use that, that anything that, that can be impacted by it. Um, the state can dictate that you have to do groundwater remediation that can be in the form of, of pumping and treating. That could be in the form of, I can do different things with chemical oxidation and injecting other compounds in the ground to destroy the contaminants. There's a variety of things we can do. Mm -hmm. Separately during construction, if there's any groundwater that needs to be managed, that has to be treated under, under the state, what they call a RIPTES permit, and that was, that was in the previous testimony. That has to be treated basically to drinking water standards as part of the construction project. And that's, that's very, very regulated by the state. And, and that, I mean, I guess these are all things one might anticipate should the project go forward. And then who, who would be the oversight person or mm -hmm. personnel for making sure that those standards were achieved mm -hmm. and met the state? The, it's a combination. It's a state and the consultant or the professional gets hired in their personal license. Okay. So I get, to, I get the joy of when I do wor my work, I self-certify on my license under pains that they can come and put me in jail and take my house away, that I'm doing this per the letter of the law. The state has a component of oversight and, and auditing and regulation that they do in conjunction. And so it's my job to follow the regulation and it's their job to ensure that I, they follow the regulation and they take me away if I don't. So well, <laughs> people in my world take it very seriously because they you you can't mess around with that stuff. That's, I'm reassured by that. I, I honestly can mm -hmm. say I don't want anyone to be taking you away <laughs> <laughs> for any. This reason. is why I don't sleep at night. Uh, yeah, well, I don't sleep at night either. Yeah. Same kind of reasons. Um, so the other thing I had in mind was when you mobilize this contaminated soil, what are the particular issues or the air? pollution issues mm -hmm. and how do how do you address those so that 
the neighbors don't have poison dust, sure. for example. Um, that's also regulated by the state. Um, previously, I, I testified that we've tested and found what's called total petroleum hydrocarbons, which is a petroleum compound in the soil. I haven't speciated that out. It's a fancy term to determine what kind What's, of petroleum. What are the real bad toxins? And, and, <laughs> and certain compounds um, in, in, say, gasoline are, tend to be more toxic than things in, say, fuel oil or heating oil. Um, and I don't know what's, which What's form there? it is. Mm -hmm. But if we dig it up, prior to that, I have to test all of those compounds, and I have to know what it is. And if there are compounds that, that are considered airborne toxins, uh, benzene, lead, things mm -hmm. like that, we're required to put dust monitoring and screen for dust at site perimeters when we're digging to ensure that we don't have any, any dust that has what they call particulate contaminants in it that would affect the neighborhood. Okay. That's something that, that gets inspected by the DEM. They oversee it. I'd say most of the sites that I work on, we don't find contamination that high. Mm -hmm. um, I did one last year in Dorchester for a flooring store, and the, the lead was through the roof. And we had 24-7 dust monitoring all over the place um, in order to ensure it. And that's part of what the state, both Massachusetts and Rhode Island do it. But I mean, Rhode Island is what matters here. Um, that is regulated. OK. And I guess the, the last question is, um, if this were to be across the street from you, how would you feel about this project objectively? Objectively. So my objective opinion. That's a loaded question. I know, I know, I know. it is. I feel, and I'm not saying this because I get paid by seasons. Well, I certainly hope not. They, they build a better facility, and it is a better run facility than any other gas station chain area um, that we have in this area. Far better, I mean, compared to Cumberland Farms, to Irving, to whoever. Mm -hmm. Far, far better. Um, and so if I had a piece of property across from a commercial property, I would have to really think about it because most people buy a house and, you know, what do they want across the street? Most people want woods across the street from them. Um, but this reminds me, the town I grew up in, there was a 40-acre piece of land that, that came up for development. This is going back in the 90s. And Legoland wanted to, to build a, a small amusement park there. This is before Legoland took off. And the town was dead set against it. They were dead set against it. And it got voted down. And I lived in that town. I lived like 1,000 feet away. And what ended up going in there was a waste transfer station. And let me tell you, if I had my choice, I, did I want the traffic with Legoland? Eh, not really. Did I want the waste <coughs> management facility? Oh, God, no. Yeah. So if I. I, I, it's a loaded question because you're, it's across right. the street well, from a commercial property. What's going to be there? Something is going to be there. I like, if it were me, I like the fact that it's a, it is a locally owned company. They, they are from Rhode Island. They are from around here. I work for them because, you know, you work for big oil, right? You're the, the, right? Um, they are by far, and, and I'm not saying this because they're I, by far better people than most that I work with. And, I, and sometimes I get to work with not so pleasant people. And I, I wouldn't be coming here every you know, month for, yes. for a, <laughs> a, a bad client. Let well, me put it that way. Certainly not out of the goodness of your heart either. Um, but I, I, would say, I guess I yeah. would say, um, that, that's not to disparage no, no. anything you've said. Um, I guess, have you ever advised against a project for Cobea based on some set of criteria that are important to you as an environmental engineer? I have. Um, there have been projects, there have been sites that, that Colby has looked at that um, either from a sensitive, re re I go back, I keep using that term, sensitive receptor. Um, you know, they, they looked at a, a property in Massachusetts that, that looked like it could work. It was right near a public well protected area. I advised against it. I don't know if they, they didn't go forward with it. I don't know if that was because of my advisement or mm -hmm. other factors. But yes, I have advised against one, okay. or more than one. OK, well, thank you. I, I appreciate your answers. And I'm sure I haven't thought of all the things I thought of last night and the night before and mm -hmm. so on. But I do appreciate the answers. And hopefully, we'll continue to be edified by people who come forward. OK, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? It's 
happy to. <clears throat> May I? Yes, of course. Could you say your name? Good evening. I'm Carol Herman, H E R R M A N N. And as Mr. Alzebeck mentioned a few times, I live on Main Road just south of the Sorry. proposed site. No, that's quite all right, because you did raise some points that concern me. I appreciate that. Um, now, I understand what you said. Mm -hmm. Due to ambient light, if mm -hmm. I go out my front door at night, and it's dark out, and I open a book, I will not be able to read it by the light shed by the season's gas at midnight. Here's another alternative situation. It's 9 o'clock at night, and I'm getting ready to go to bed in one of my second floor bedrooms, oh, thank you. two of which face Colbia. And my house is up on a little rise, mm -hmm. so I see over the tops of the next house. I turn out my overhead. How much light is spilling into my bedroom from the canopy or the season's sign or all the lights that are lighting the parking lot. How much light? Can you answer that? Do we need the simulation? I probably need the simulation to, or the, right. I don't know that I can answer that off the top. Right. Well, she, if I may, she's asking for illumination in the oh, room. Oh, illumination in the room. If you can see it. Oh, okay. Well, that, if it You'd hits be able my to, eye. No, she's asking yeah. for illumination okay. in the room. Wait a minute. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I guess the, the, the question, as I understand it, is I misunderstood the question. Um, I, thought, I thought she was mentioning seeing the light, but I believe right. you're referring to how much illumination, I guess, would you see? It, or would you, what would you experience in the second story? So how difficult would it be for me to fall asleep before midnight when the lights mm -hmm. are turned off? I think if we don't know what the views are in our homes, particularly our bedrooms, then this board cannot make a determination on whether this project will be detrimental to the health, safety, and welfare of residents. Because certainly, if we can't go to sleep until midnight, that's detrimental to our health, safety, and welfare mm -hmm. of the surrounding residents. Um, Mr. Stoltzman and you have both brought up the need to consider alternate uses to that property and to compare those negative impacts. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a wastewater treatment. Oh, I was referring to something in my hometown. Yeah. It wouldn't be permitted in this location. Right. And so the alternate uses that I think the zoning board might consider and weigh the negative impacts, relatively speaking, would be an accountant's office or a law office or even a bank all of which would be closed by 6 o'clock and completely dark. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hmm? Oh, I think we know what that one Susan Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E um, the first two answered uh, two of my questions, so that's two, less, two questions less I'll have to ask you. <laughs> um, in all of our existing five gas stations, none have separate pole lights. This has, mm -hmm. I think, half a dozen around that are like 15 feet, 16 feet high. All lighting of these five gas stations occurs only from the lights that are underneath the canopies. Okay, there's no, all the canopies are flat around the edge. There's no lights around all of them, all these five in town. So the only lighting that I've seen is only from the lights under the canopy and inside the store. You're also having lights, not only the 15 foot, 16 foot <coughs> pole lights, but you also have the light around the canopy, the canopy lights down, mm -hmm. plus there's gooseneck lights outside the store, the building. 
right, all around. Why does Seasons need all this lighting when the other five and two of them have convenience stores and they don't have any outside lights outside them, they just have the light inside the store and just the canopy lights coming down. Mm -hmm. There's no pole lights on any of these. Mm -hmm. Can you, why do you need I, so much light? I guess two parts, I, you know, in terms of why lights are here or there, isn't really what I advise seasons on. Um, you know, they have their design and, and they have, I, I testify towards how much light does, does that give off. But to your question about, I'll start with the goosenecks. I know the gooseneck lights on the edge of the building are primarily there to illuminate the sidewalk. So when customers come up to the facility, they don't trip on the sidewalk. Um, that's kind of a, a, a standard thing. Um, I, you know, in terms of how many yard lights there are, the, excuse me, I use the word yard lights to refer to the, the, the pole lights. 40, the pole lights. Um, typically, you know, I, I, I do, I'm going to feel bad for my client for a minute, um, if you'll entertain me, in that I know a lot of communities that they go in front of complain that there are insufficient yard lights and they want, the, the police department wants more lights because they want extra lightage extra extra lighting on the edge of the of the of the road i know you know i, I mentioned earlier lexington wanted uh, a light pole moved and added to shine more um, so sometimes i think they try to strike a balance between what what is good for enough illumination for for pedestrians for for traffic to to flow in and out um, versus what's too much for the neighborhood what's too much for the area and they try to strike a balance and and i think <clears throat> to a degree, it becomes a discussion here with the community, with, with the town, uh, various boards as to, you know, do you want six? Do you want eight? Do you want four? How about zero? Yeah. Well, that's... <laughs> and the reason is one of these has a convenience store. Mm -hmm. There's no outside lights. There's no pole lights. And it is, an, it is in a pedestrian-friendly zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are people walking in from different areas. There's sidewalks. There's, like I said, the only light is from underneath the canopy, down on the people that are gassing up, mm -hmm. and inside the store. There's no gooseneck lights. People can see the little curb from the walk. Yeah. Nobody that I know of, uh, of has ever tripped on the ledge mm -hmm. that goes into the store. So again, in this town, especially, and that is where there's no houses around that one, okay? okay? So they could have pole lights, but they don't because they don't need them, okay? And it is a shell station. The, <coughs> the, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, so the only difference between this one is the fact that there's residents all the way around this. We don't need to see all these lights. We don't want to see all these lights. Okay? If we have a street light, it's like, oh my gosh, it's too bright, you know? And that's on all night. Okay. Yeah. This is not an opportunity. No, I understand that. I'm trying to, to say the difference between the street light and the pole lights. These pole lights are going to be on until midnight. That's a lot for. People well, and for five in the morning. To, the to decide what the hours are, we can. Okay, okay we can but still, I mean, they're going to be on. They're 15 feet high. So, I still don't understand why you need all that. The other thing I wanted to ask is, keeping on the fact of the of the lights. When I'm driving down Sousa Road, um, or Main Road, I drive down Sousa Road and I I look in, and the other day I saw like four deer there grazing on the property. But that's higher than the road, mm. okay? Um, I'm like looking up and, and I can see it higher than the road. Did you take the elevation of this site into consideration for your lighting um, analysis? The, the lighting plan, the illumination plan is, is independent of elevation because it's only shining basically down. So if, if the property is up high or down low, it's still, the lighting is still what it does. If the lights were not designed the way they were and the, the 
property was up at a hill and it started to spill over, then it, it would spill over further in that. But, but that's what I'm concerned about is because yeah. the elevation that it's on is already into the neighbor's mm -hmm. second floor houses, second floor rooms. Yeah, the, this lighting plan is designed for the site to be leveled and the lighting to not, ex the illumination not to extend beyond the property line. That's what it was designed to do. Okay, how about noise? Did you take the elevation into consideration when you did the noise analysis? I've done, the, I, I haven't done noise studies at this property because it's not built. All of the studies that I've done have been at a variety of sites, some higher, some lower, um, some are flat. It, every site is different, and I factored in all of that, and what I reported was the maximum sound distance that I have. Okay, so <coughs> can you conjecture as to what the noise might be on this height, this elevation of this particular site with these, um, all the noise that's around the, the uh, intercom from the yeah. speaker and all that? What I can, I can't qualitatively say it and give you a, a decibel reading. Um, I can tell you that I would not expect it to be at all really different. Um, if and you don't think it would project out to the not any more, not any more than because it's only so loud, and there's such a distance that it, it, you wouldn't hear it. it. You just wouldn't. Okay, so there's deciduous trees, which you said you took also into consideration. Not for noise, but not for, for noise. Correct. Okay, so if there were evergreen trees, which really should be at this site to block that from the neighbors on the south mm -hmm. and the north, because there's got to be neighbors on the north as well, um, would that make a difference between noise and the light? Noise, no, not really. It's the noise won't extend off the property line, so adding trees to the edge doesn't do anything. Okay, evergreens. Evergreens, deciduous trees, it it, it won't. So there okay. there there have been times where so we have a that Colby has a location, and, and I keep going back to Lexington because that's just the one that they just had me do a million studies on. But um, there's an abutter, <coughs> there's a residential abutter. I don't know, he's like 20 feet behind the the store, and the town was very concerned about that. And in that case, um, Colbia planted a, a slew of, of evergreen type vegetation, put in a fence, and they wanted me to test noise and sound on the front side of the fence and on the, on the back side of the fence. And on the front side of the fence, it was within 90 feet. There were decibel readings. On the back side, it was nothing. And, and that was designed that way. But that's a, that's a, on this map, that a butter would basically be his house would be where the loading zone is. That's how close that was. Um, and it was designed to, to not generate noise. Um, okay. So adding, in this case, there's so much land and there's so much space, the noise wouldn't be able to travel that far. So adding additional, if they add more trees or not add more trees, it doesn't really affect anything. So how about the lighting, if you had mm -hmm. evergreens there instead of the deciduous? Any tree, any tree blocks light and a tree that but doesn't... not one that... And, and that, a, not a deciduous. Well, that's what I'm saying. A, a tree that, that doesn't lose its leaves in the fall, obviously, and keeps you know, needles or whatnot blocking light in the winter, blocks more light. Okay. All right. Um, the TV screens that are on these pumps, mm. can't you shut those off? In terms of just all the time? Or Correct. That's an <laughs> operational decision. Okay, that because I have been to other gas stations and where they've had them. Mm. And they've been off. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, how nice it is. Because I'm not hearing this obnoxious whatever it is. I don't even pay attention to it. The word of And the I'm day. hearing yeah. this one go off as I'm feeling mm -hmm. my pump. And then the other side that's saying something totally different. And yeah. it's like, it's horrible. So I know this other gas station that can turn them off. So I said, oh, I guess they can be turned off if they can. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was asking. Yeah. Can't we turn these off? And that's, I, that goes back to the whole operational thing that they decide. All I can really speak to is if they are there and they are on, the, the noise footprint of those is about a 15-foot radius. Beyond that, you don't hear it. But to your point, you know, if you're filling at a, at a pump, you definitely hear it. It's designed to, to try to get you to, I don't know, learn the new word of the day or whatever. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's... Okay, um, 
The only other thing I, which is another design issue, is the Bristol location of the seasons. Are you familiar with what that one is? Mm -hmm. So on that canopy, there's no, it's not straight around. It's angled and it's all shingled. Mm -hmm. And there's just one little shell, that's all that's on there. You don't have this obnoxious yellow white mm -hmm. lit thing. Yeah. It's just nicely shingled. So it's I just but so that but I did notice because I, I sail race on Wednesdays and in the summertime. And then my skipper lift has his boat on that. So I go right by there all mm -hmm. the time. When I come back at night, it's totally, but I can see that from like a block away because it's high. I, I'm the, sorry, I, you know, if you're going to- No, 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 I'm asking about the light well, from that one. Well, you're giving testimony and you're not under oath. But, I mean, you no. can ask questions, but not- I, I am, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to say, do you know, is the, the, that canopy seems to be a lot higher than most of them, do you? And that I, seems like it reflects the light more. I don't know how high that canopy is, and if it's that, I wasn't really doing much consulting for, for seasons when that one was built. It was, I kind of came in right at the end of that. Oh, okay. So I don't really know that one as well. I've been to it multiple times, but I don't know what the height of so the canopy is. So you can't compare is. that to, with others, I, because it just really. seems like a lot, to, a lot brighter because it's so yeah. high. I don't know that one. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Too much for traffic. Hello, my name is Jamie French, and I live at Craig Avenue. And let's see. You know, you just said that a waste was it a wastewater uh, would not be permitted on that side. I, that's my understanding. It would not. I, I was doing an example right, of my childhood. Right, but it's also well, to me it seems kind of strange that if you didn't do diligence, you would know that that a gas station is not allowed at this site, that signage is not allowed at this site, and that a drive through window is not allowed at this site. Now, you just said this other usage would not be allowed. Why would this be any different? Let, let, me, let me answer that. Ms. French, that's incorrect. A drive through and the signage and a convenience store with gas pumps is allowed at this site by the granting of a special use permit. That's why we're here. It is a conditionally granted subject to a special use permit. That's the hearing that we're here today. Okay. So to suggest that that is not allowed at the site is incorrect. Okay. If it was incorrect, if you were correct, we wouldn't be here tonight at 8.30 going through this. So yeah. just so the record's clear, because I've heard this in the public, that is incorrect, it is allowed. This, this applicant could put a convenience store there tomorrow, a CVS, any kind of retail store they wanted to. It's the gas pumps, it's the drive-through, and it's the increase in the signage that puts us before us for a special use permit. That's what I just listed. Right. Thank well, you. you said there wasn't permitted, but that's not accurate. Oh, okay. It, it's, uh, yes, it's words. And that is true, but it, it, you know, when people, when people do due diligence and they th see things that say not, you know, you need a special use permit, a lot of people, don't have that type of money, or they, they, they back away. They don't. You need a lot of money to push for these special use variances. And, and it just seems that, you know, we shouldn't allow money to influence everything we do. Um, it's, you know, as for lighting, I think that place is going to glow like a bad nightlight, just glowing. And I know it's a just personal ask, opinion. Just ask questions. You can speak at the end of this hearing. We will take public comment, and everybody can give their opinion of what they think oh, should be done. But I thought but we were talking about lighting. Just, 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 but you haven't asked a question yet. <laughs> oh, well, will it glow like a, a large nightlight? And, and will there be humming associated with it? Because I can always hear humming from those type of lights. 
Uh, in terms of the humming, there should not be any humming. It's, it's all LED lights. A lot of the humming was sort of a, an artifact of incandescent and halogen lights. Um, I would not expect any humming. None of the other sites they have hum. Um, in terms of glowing, the, the photometric plan suggests that it would not. I would argue that it does not. Um, this quickly gets into the subjective discussion that we had earlier. What does it look like and is it acceptable or not? Um, right. and, that's and this is something that, subjective. That, that should be known. I mean, because <coughs> I've watched many, many buildings be built with, with dark sky lighting and they glow. And, and I would think that you would be aware of your illumination as it reflects down and hits that high pavement and then disperses. Well, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Does any member of the board have any questions? Seeing none. So I think we have an option here. We can go. Can we take a break? Oh. Let him finish. Then. No. I'm, we could proceed with our next witness, but there there were questions on some of the materials we submitted, and it seems to me it might be more advantageous to clean that up first. It's your call. Okay, so why don't, if, if it satisfies, what, there were questions on renderings while we have, Ms. Guillermo, after a break. Yeah, why don't we just After a break, then we'll come back with Ms. Guillermo. I think there were questions on, on plans submitted. Uh, for the record, I'll be referring to um, all the, do uh, the renderings depictions uh, captioned HFA in the bottom left corner, including without limitation, your package, applicant's package at page 13. And that is the one that depicts Sousa Road. It's it's no, Road. the one I'm interested in seeing is on page 13 of the packet and depicts Sousa Road. Can you say page 13, because mine are not numbered. Where no, are they're you? not numbered. You just have to look at your Adobe Doc, the top of the. No, I don't have the Adobe. Oh. The Is this the direct one on the screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay. That one. All right, hold on. Just, can we just describe it for the record? So this is a, a rendering with a red car. This is what street, ma'am? I believe this is Sousa Road, Sousa Road looking to Maine. Right to Maine. Okay. This is, I believe what the, the uh, depiction is attempting to show. Okay. Thank you. I, I don't want to make any characterization as to what it is. All right. <clears throat> so this view. Um, let's see. How were these, uh, and by the way, also for the record, there are five of them. There are five similar renderings, all with HFA in capital letters in the bottom left-hand corner, showing various roadways and scenes of the proposed development. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Say again? I was looking up here. It's for their air conditioning. How were these uh, renderings prepared? So Depreed Engineering has prepared all of the site plans that are in our packet. Um, a landscape architect had prepared the landscape plans, and then HFA is the architect of record who prepared all of the architectural plans that are also in your packet. Um, following um, it was the last meeting we had, Depreed worked with Colbia and HFA. HFA actually is the firm that prepared these renderings using all three of those plans that I mentioned, and the CAD files that go along with those. So there's elevation data on there, there's tree species, and they plug those into their, their software and they generate uh, these plans with a focus on the detailing on the, the subject property, and she they do the their best way. to mass sketch in the surrounding areas, but they are graphic representations. And that's why they're showing a fog line on Sousa Road that doesn't exist, right? A, was it? That white line on the right-hand side? The striping. So yeah. I, I, I personally looked at these and reviewed them and provided comments to the architect afterwards um, using our site photos and street view. And again, the danger with renderings is that they are computer graphics, so you have things that may not look, ex existing features that may not look exactly 
you know, the color, the, the road starts to fade, there's cracking and whatnot. So yes, yeah, some of the, the line work in the street shows fresh painting that. So that's a yes, it doesn't have a bright fog line actually on Sousa Road, right? That's correct, I, okay. I believe that's correct. And also this rendering does not have I mean, Sousa Road does not have the breakdown lane that is shown in this rendering. Fair to say? I, I believe it's just a wide expanse of pavement. Um, there was some striping shown in the street view. I was out there today, and I can't recall if there, there was the white markings or not. OK. And there's no, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Yeah, guys, you can't, you can't, can't hackle from the crowd. We're, we're building a record here, so let the, let the applicant and the, uh, let the objectors please answer questions and let her answer. Thank you. I really want to focus on what's not here so that we can evaluate the value, if any, that these renderings might have. Does it depict the building in its current location? Building's been moved. That's correct. This shows two lanes on the left side of that building as you see it. So that's a yes. Yes. It does depict the building in the current location. Mm -hmm. And none of these five HFA renderings have a north indicator, correct? Correct. I don't believe there's any north arrows on these. These, although they may take from the CAD drawings, do not purport to show, do, do not purport to have anything to scale. Is that fair to say? These are to scale. Yes, they are to the, scale. Yes, they are to scale. The scale that they are at is not indicated on these drawings, but they are, they are to scale. Do you know what the scale is? I do not. Okay. Um, these, none of these drawings show the elevation of the lot, right? There's no topography shown on these plans, but they did use the topographic information to create these renderings. Okay. Let's scroll then over to this one. I don't know what number it is. I'm sorry. That shows a flat lot, doesn't it? Well, look, let's identify it just oh, by describing it for the record because it's not numbered here. Uh. Oh, sorry. So sorry. That's not you. Um, you want to yeah. describe well, it? Well, just it's a uh, rendering which that shows the uh, a pickup truck at the. It looks like at the front of the store with the canopy behind it. It looks like it's a side view. From, I can't tell what street that is, but Susan. 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 Susan Road. Okay, back to the question. No showing the elevation of the lot. Do we agree on that? No, there's elevation shown. The, the elevation of the lot is, is flat. It's relatively flat for the proposed conditions. So that, that rendering reflects the proposed conditions of that lot. Okay. And no depiction of the dumpsters, correct? Uh, that's incorrect. The dumpster is in the back right-hand corner. It's a darker color. You can see it behind the bypass lane to the right. I'm sorry. Okay. So that puts the dumpsters on the far side of the lot away from Sousa. Am I correct? That's I just correct. Make, I want to make sure I understand what's being depicted. Okay. Yep. That's all I have. Great. Great. Any questions? Thank you. Follow up. And if I could steal your dongle there. Okay. So you indicated that um, you evaluated those renderings, HFA renderings, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, correct. And um, that you also, I believe, um, did some ground truth and you went out there. Mm -hmm. And um, you also, um, as I understand it, um, did some Google maps, street maps or Google maps. Yeah. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. <coughs> so <clears throat> the. Um, <clears throat> This right here is going back to, I don't know, you call it the red car exhibit. Is that accurate, Mr. Um, 
Marcelo? Yeah. Okay, I believe that's page 13 of the packet. That's what uh, Ms. Benson was asking you about. Um, and you indicated that, you know, these are renderings, they may not be so accurate. Mm -hmm. So, and you did go to Google Maps. So yeah. I'm going to, uh, if you will, uh, Madam Chair, this will be a chalk. Okay, um, this is live right now. I am, I am, I am on, um, I am on uh, Sousa Road. Certainly not live. Okay. Wow. All right, and so um, we can, you know, so you, you go going back to. Well, Mr. Davidio, how do we how do I identify this document? Um, it's Google Maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Street View mm -hmm. of of Sousa Road. Heading eastbound. And you'll be submitting a copy of this to the board? Sure. <laughs> if, if it's necessary. There's more demonstrative. Uh, the, the witness indicated that she actually looked at Google Maps. So is this accurately reflecting your uh, evaluation of when you looked at Google Maps? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the renderings are supposed to depict proposed conditions on the right-hand side, which is what sh is shown on the right-hand side. You can see the reference I made to there being striping that has faded away on that ground. You can see the white lines on each side, and you can see the yellow lines in the middle. And if you go back further, you can see the fencing and the vegetation <coughs> on the left-hand side of, of the street. Okay, so in your estimation, based in basically looking at what you already looked at, this is Google Maps, you looked at this earlier today, you actually went out there, would say maybe there's, I don't know, six inches between this white line and, and the curb? Uh, from this photo, yes. Well, when you were out there, was it six I, inches? I don't know if it was six inches, but the the actual width of that roadway is taken from from the mapping that we have, and you know whether okay. it's shown on the edge or shown on the middle, the focus is really not on the striping; it's to be on on the proposed site conditions. Okay, and over here, there seems to be a white line. It's kind of I can go further. I, I up. guess, Chris, my problem is, and I'm, I'm not going to interrupt. But you say over here, like this is a record, right? So we've got to yeah. we got to describe it for the court because this so will as eventually we, be. Let me finish. This will be eventually a transcript. So you need to describe what you're saying over here, what you're depicting, because the court or this board is not going to be able to remember a week from now what you were referring to. Okay. So as we are heading, we're we looking at the north northerly boundary of Sousa Road, heading eastward. We see a white striped line. Is that correct, Ms. Kulgamo? I'm sorry, we're going, e we're going west. So, excuse me. Heading westbound. Yeah, we are, we are heading westbound. It's, I, I have no idea. Yeah, we're, we're heading towards the river. Okay, main road is, 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 is here, so we're heading westbound, Ms. Kulgamo. Looking at the north side of Sousa Road, do you see the white line which is shown? I as, do. Okay is now when I go to this rendering, it seems to me that this white line looking in the same vantage point, westbound, looking at the northerly side of Sousa Road, there seems to be a like a significant difference between that white line and the edge of the, of the vegetation. Is that accurate to say? That does not exactly match the roadway. You are correct. Okay. Okay. So, I want to go to Flood character with the road. Can I submit the Make sure he submits the first one. Okay, this is back to the exhibit that you produced, I think it was at March 3rd. Sorry, was it March 3rd that you introduced it? March 5th. March 5th, I'm sorry. For some reason or another, it's registering as March 8th on, on my title of my document, but um, okay. <coughs> we, we may have emailed it to you on the 8th. Sure. Um, but just suffice it to say that this is a accurate in terms of what, you know, the, these, these slides that I'm going through. I just don't want there to be a misrepresentation that I'm showing something you didn't submit. And if there is, please let me know. What is this? This <laughs> which, is... Which one are we looking at? Well, um, I'm going to get to that in a second, Madam Chair. So this is, uh, I believe, page 10 of 54, at least as, <coughs> as it's shown. Um, 
uh, let's see, how, how do you want to describe it, Mr. Uh, Marcello? We'll call it uh, looking in a, um, a, a southwesterly direction, right? And there happens to be a... a um, I think we already described this one. Yeah, right. Southeasterly direction. Yes, southeasterly direction, thank you. <laughs> looking southeasterly. In fact, if you were, he's not here, but if you were at Mr. Winter's driveway, almost, who lives right across the street, this is kind of like he's looking towards uh, Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Money's house. Mr. Looking Anderson, at, hold on. We're making a record, yeah. and it's very difficult for the court reporter to take his testimony, and then we have background noise. <coughs> so I know you're anxious, and I appreciate your enthusiasm, but you're not helping anybody by muddling this record because the court reporter is not going to be able to get this down. So if you let Mr. DeVideo ask his question and you let the witness answer the question, we'll be a lot, get out here a lot sooner and we'll have a lot cleaner record for either for appellate purposes or for whatever. Mm -hmm. So really, I know everyone's getting tired and, and everyone's a little punchy, but we're really getting a difficult, I'm having difficulty hearing over the noise. So Ms. Guillermo, we're looking in a southeasterly direction. Okay. Is that accurate from this? Yeah. Okay. And does this depict the homes that are uh, on the south side of Sousa Road? Uh, I believe those are the massing objects that you see in white beyond the, the vegetation. So is there any reason why you didn't actually depict homes with windows? Uh, standard practice, I believe, is off-site. There is not as much focus, just like you'd see in a Google Maps, and they're focused on the subject property, but I don't, okay. that's all I can speculate. Well, this rendering, um, the vegetation that's depicted here, um, fairly masked those homes, right? You can't really see the massing, excuse me, the massing that you describe as the homes. Is the vegetation fairly masking that? Uh, it appears to be. You can see some of the white in the background. Okay. So I want to go back to actually. Okay. So I know that you indicated that you'd been out there ground truthing these pictures. So is this what I'm showing you now, Mr. Marcello? This is Google Maps on Main Road, mm -hmm. uh, looking in a southeasterly direction, okay? Is this, uh, Ms. Gilliam? With, 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 sorry, with a white car? With, with a, a car. white car, correct. Um, and, a and a black car. And a black car heading yeah. s southbound and a white car heading northbound. Uh, Ms. Guillermo, is this somewhat accurate of the same angle that we just saw in, in the HFA rendering? Yeah, so when I was reviewing the renderings that HFA provided, I was actually a little further back looking at the same view that you were, and they actually hadn't shown trees, vegetation at that corner, and we added those based on, on this graphic from a further back. So, um, of course, this is Main Road, uh, looking in a southward manner. Um, Sousa is coming in from the east. Okay, and that's the corner of Maine and Sousa as to where this project is going to be located, correct? Correct, on the okay. left-hand side. Yeah, on the left-hand side of this image. So in this image, or Google, real, there's, you can actually see a house back here. Is that correct? Yep, on that right-hand side you can see a house. Right behind the white car. Mm -hmm. Okay, here you can actually see Mr. Winter's house. Is that correct, over here? There is a house there. Yeah. Okay, which is... Um, uh, the first house, if you will, heading eastbound on Sousa. Is that accurate? I believe so, yes. Okay. So just going back to, um, excuse me, uh, let's see here. Your rendering, well, here it is right here. What I showed you on Google, now I'm going back to page 9. This is the one looking southeast at the proposed project HFA uh, uh, rendering, okay? Here, it doesn't show any houses, whereas looking at it, and it has a lot of vegetation, whereas Street View, Google, doesn't really show that. You can actually see the houses and there's less vegetation. Is that accurate? The 
white boxes in the background behind the trees are, are the houses that are shown there. There's vegetation that's been input from the landscape plan along the border of our site parallel to Sousa Road. So you have a mix of proposed vegetation along with the existing vegetation on that roadway, and, and that's how the, the model is generated. So, so that vegetation in front of the first home on Sousa Drive, Mr. Winter's home, that's the vegetation that exists there now? There's vegetation shown at the corner, and then there's proposed vegetation on the our side of that white. SUV. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the vegetation that is on the south side of Sousa Road in front of Mr. on Mr. Winter's property. Is that the accurate depiction of the vegetation in front of his house? There's a graphic representation of trees there. It's up for interpretation if it exactly matches. Well. It's the... the, the vegetation at the corner at the end not it's not that house well there's his house right but and I see trees to the right it's a different view that you're looking at and comparing to this tree's on this property that's a different view this yep. the vastly house. different yeah. Well, this is your view right here, right? Okay. So you're saying I should go this way? Move north. No, so you move south. Go back north. You can make sure that these photographs are submitted for the record, right? Sure. That looks almost exactly like the record. Okay. So that's 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 an accurate depiction of, of the HFA? If you were to go back one more one more view. Okay. That's what we would. What we'd I, I looked at these myself yeah, to compare right, them. If you were to click back more, go, just hit the back arrow and look down the street. I asked the architect to take a screenshot of that corner to reflect the houses that were on that street along with the vegetation that's at the corner and superimpose it with the new vegetation that is along the perimeter of our site. Okay. So, as a reference point, we've got this fire hydrant here on the East side of Main Road, there's a fire hydrant. Do you see that? There's an existing fire hydrant okay. there, yeah. Does, does your rendering show that? There's uh, a relocated fire hydrant okay. shown so in one of the renderings okay. that's further off your screen. Okay. Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rob, do you have any Ooh, redirect? No, I'm not any redirect. Anyone in the audience wish to ask um, Ms. Guillermo any questions? Seeing none, I think we will. Uh, May I suggest we approach off the record for one second? Yeah, um, sure. Oh, we're all oh, I'm sorry. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Members of the public question. I apologize. We, oh, do you have questions? Dave? We're on the record. Were there questions from the audience? Sure. Oh, if there are no questions from the public, I'd like to approach on the schedule issue. Sure. Before we adjourn. Oh, and I'm assuming we would then adjourn. Is there some other, other than your normal administrative business? No, no, no. We're, we are, okay. we will be out of here shortly. <laughs> We're going back on the record, so please take any conversations outside. Um, we have had a brief conference on uh, matters of scheduling. Uh, we have our, our next regular date is April 3rd, and um, between now and then, we will get, the parties will agree on what date is best for our special meeting. Um, and I know that some members of the audience indicated they weren't going to be here for uh, school vacation week, and we're going to work around that schedule so they can be here. Um, uh, one of them is a, a you know is affected lives across the street from the proposed site so um, we're gonna probably pick a date late April but um, we will make that announcement at the April 3rd meeting so I'm gonna make a motion to adjourn uh, I will, will you let us know when that is in advance we'll, we'll know we'll know on April 3rd no well, we'll be circulating a date between I mean, the there, board. There are dates yes. that I'm not available. Right, that's what I'm saying. Right. 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 We're, we're going to do just like we've been doing 
by email, we will ask right. the clerk yeah. to circulate okay. dates. All right. But first, we're going to get dates from the clients. So. Yeah. Yeah. One step at a time. Uh, I, will, I will second the motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Unanimous. Thank you.